Okay. Good morning, Commissioner Ed Rothstein. It is Thursday, February 16th for our open session. We will uh, go into close for legal advice afterwards and then back into open session this afternoon for a couple of updates. As always, before we start, let's uh, take a moment, stand for a Pledge of Allegiance, and a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, I feel like every Thursday I'm saying something to this effect. Wishing strength and courage for those um, loved ones of those that have lost their lives in Michigan State uh, the other day. And continuing uh, to go through the recovery in Turkey and Syria from that massive earthquake that happened a few weeks ago. It's just amazing how uh, something so tragic is not anywhere to be seen <laughs> in any part of the news. Uh, <clears throat> and um, it is still a extreme tragedy. Um, let's start with Commissioner Vigliotti. What's on your mind? Oh, thank you very much, Commissioner Rothstein. I uh, will do my best to be brief. I've got a couple of things this morning. Um, so uh, I'll let others talk about the community uh, or the College Board of Trustees. I know everybody attended that the other day. Um, I have been out and about speaking with those who are for and against solar development, including visiting where solar development may occur. I very much appreciate the continued input that we've had uh, and having the chance to see some things firsthand on the ground. Um, and on that note, and I know it will be mentioned again later, that we do have the public hearing uh, coming up on February 23rd at 6 p.m. here in the Reagan Room. Um, locally, New Windsor is going to be holding a station format town hall on uh, Thursday, uh, February 23rd at the New Windsor Fire Department at 101 High Street for those interested in or with questions about the ongoing Maryland Route 31 improvements project. Uh, questions are going to be able to be asked and answered that evening, and anybody who lives on Route 31 Main Street or High Street is strongly encouraged to attend. Uh, on Monday, I had the chance to visit the future Northwest Regional Park uh, north of Tawnytown along Route 194, along with uh, Parks and Rec Director Jeff, or Recreation and Parks Director Jeff Daggetts, Chief of Parks Brad Rogers, and Digital Media Manager Chris Swam. Swam uh, Northwest Park uh, is a 145-acre site that was purchased in 2019 using program open space funds, and that's uh, funding that could only be used for the purchasing of parkland. Uh, before this purchase, there uh, were no county-owned parks that existed west of Littlestown Pike and north of Middleburg Road. Uh, the future park has 50 acres of existing forest, plenty of rare, flat, open land, and will allow for the environmental protection of a huge part of Piney Creek. Uh, later on uh, this year, we're going to be soliciting proposals for a design firm to develop a master plan for the site. Uh, that's going to include public meetings, citizen input, uh, consideration of various amenities, etc. Uh, and details about these are going to be forthcoming. And as, a, uh, as an amusing side note, uh, as you see some of these uh, photos that uh, Mr. Swam had taken, he was operating an aerial drone to do photography. And as he was operating this drone, he was explaining to me that you know, certain large birds quite frequently attacked drones. And about 10 seconds later, a large bird started circling the drone. And Mr. Swam was fortunately able to avoid becoming lunch. Um, so on, uh, so on Wednesday, I had the opportunity to visit the historic courthouse uh, for a tour with the esteemed Judge Brian D. Leonardo, as well as getting a better, more in-depth sense of the operations that go on at that courthouse. Um, you know, one of the really cool things, and you saw a picture there a second ago, uh, was that we have a legal library here in Carroll County. Uh, and uh, you know, it's open to the public, which is really cool. And there are books in there that go back hundreds of years and you know, if you consider uh, law, order, and justice as a central component of what determines civilization, you know, I think we have something quite exceptional in this county and uh, in this country. And uh, of course, you saw in another picture there, uh, the Judge Judy Leonardo hanging over the, uh, the side of the uh, bench at the front. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good tour. And again, it's open to anybody. And again, the legal library is open to the public. 
Uh, and that is it for me for today. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, Mr. Schaefer, feel free to go visit that legal library anytime you'd like. And, uh, but I didn't call you esteemed. No, you don't have any points of order at this point. You need to sign up. To Commissioner get Kyler. You can't just walk in. Right, I'm right. Sorry. Yeah, but, you well, have. But it's okay. open, it is open to the public, right? I appreciate that. You do need to sign up. You can't just go to the courthouse. Right, you can't right. just walk in. Why, but, but it is why, open why, to the public. Why did I open up this can? Commissioner Kyler. Um, I want to mention, I know it's early, but the uh, second annual Veterans Celebration of Carroll County will be Sunday, May 7th and put it on your calendars, a great event. Um, been attending MAKO meetings and MAKO virtual meetings and been trying to do as much as possible of it on Wednesdays in Annapolis and and we're getting to meet a bunch of the delegates, a bunch of the senators, it's, it's very positive. Um, Commissioner Vigliotti mentioned the uh, Carroll Community College presentation, it was awesome. Um, and I also attended their uh, Board of Trustees meeting uh, last night. But one of the things um, I think that impressed me the most, the, the, the information was good. Um, I love to see stuff like their ranking and, and the impact they have on the communities, et cetera, et cetera. But a, a lot of people give us tours, a lot of people meet with us. They had every member of the Board of Trustees there, plus one had to be virtual. To me, that's impressive that the that Board of Trustees are that bought into it, that they take that time that morning to meet us. And, and there were staff there too, and of course, the President of College, but I just thought that was impressive. Um, I toured the Carroll County Youth Services Bureau, um, Lynn Davis, that was awesome. And uh, it's just amazing, and they're busting out of that building, and they'll probably be busting out of the addition when they build it. Um, and it's just, uh, again, um, something I mentioned during that tour, when you see the names on the doors of donors, it's uh, Carroll County's pretty great. And I challenge other counties to have a place where we all work together, and uh, it seems like Everybody in Carroll County seems to reach out and work with all the other players. <coughs> and as far as citizens, you see a lot of the same names that have donated a room or a building or whatever, and, and that's impressive. I met with uh, Jeff Daggett's Rec and Parks and talked about stuff going on in my district. And again, that's, that's, that's nice, uh, whatever we can get for recreation and quality of life for the kids and the adults is great. Again, a as Commissioner Vigliotti said, I've met with some uh, solar people on both sides of the fence, looked at some properties with both sides of the fence, and it's going to be interesting, and, it and then to hear the public hearing. Um, I'm scheduling some various meetings with some of the fire companies, and um, they're always interesting. It's, again, in Carroll County, it's tough to get volunteers today, but we seem to be surviving doing it and and the hybrid system is going to help it out a lot but it, it's impressive and i think i mentioned in an earlier meeting i'm surprised um they have a lot of young volunteers i just wrote a uh, letter of reference for uh, a young carroll <coughs> county person who's been a volunteer since high school and is applying for full-time in Howard County, but it, it's a lot of young guys um, jumping into that. People that you know say the young, young men and women aren't doing that. They they are jumping into stuff. And then one thing I want to mention, um, Commissioner Rothstein's mentioned it more than I, but as a contractor all my life, you learn sometimes. There's things you always think you can do everything yourself better than others, but you learn sometimes that you need to subcontract a specialist. I'm thinking about letting my uh, early comments, I'm thinking about subcontracting to Commissioner Vigliotti and see if he'll pick up my comments too. Understood. <laughs> Thank you. He, he is the esteemed, so. <laughs> <coughs> Commissioner Gordon. Thank you. Uh, first <coughs> and foremost, wanted to mention that on February 25th we, at Westminster High School from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., we have the Carroll County History Day, which will include a variety of students that have participating in National History Day contest. Uh, this year's topic is Frontiers in History, People, Places, and Ideas. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the public to go out and see what 
many of our students are working on relating to history as well as interact with displays of local organizations and individuals, I would definitely suggest you take a look at that if you have the time. Uh, I'd also like to thank, uh, last week uh, we had the Carroll County Board of Elections Director Catherine Berry and John Woodley, who's a member of the Board of Elections, and uh, I truly appreciate the hard work that everyone does over at Board of Elections. Uh, as the public, we all know you <coughs> go and you vote and you understand the process in some fashion, but I would suggest to anyone, if you have the time, look into what a Board of Elections does for all of us in this community, in the county. I would say they are top notch uh, without question. I know they had mentioned that several of us had, had toured the Board of Elections and I would strongly recommend that any of, any of our commissioners that have not toured yet, please consider doing so. Uh, I'd also like to mention the City of Westminster just recently received two grants for uh, crosswalks which is a wonderful situation given the uh, concerning issues that seem to be happening quite a bit in the municipality with lack of driver awareness and the public. Uh, I've heard from a wide array of constituents of various concerns of almost being hit uh, to the public that's driving. Please pay attention and look, don't be in a rush, but take a minute. Um, also, you know, with hopefully with these uh, grants and maybe some potential ones, they'll see uh, additional improvements to uh, these crosswalks and we won't have any injuries or fatalities. Um, earlier in the week, as mentioned by uh, Commissioner Vigliotti and Commissioner Kyler, uh, the board met with the community college, President Ball, and the entire board. Uh, I thought it was a very productive meeting discussing the community college. I thought it was wonderfully open with conversation, and I greatly appreciate their willingness <coughs> to have positive discussions as we move forward and have conversations with them. It was uh, much appreciated uh, to see that sort of uh, professionalism. Also this week, I met with the ARC and Executive Director yep. Donald Rao. Uh, got a tour over there. I uh, was very impressed with all that they do in our community and truly they are an asset uh, without question. Uh, also this week, I met with uh, Richard Turner, the, county, the uh, Community Media Center's Executive Director. Uh, received a tour. I've also been there a number of times <coughs> in the past as I think uh, many of uh, uh, my fellow commissioners have. I did learn some very interesting facts, though, that from a technical infrastructure side, our media center it has infrastructure that no other media center has in the county, so we are above and beyond in that fashion. Um, as we move forward, uh, you know, yearly in, in our community, obviously communication is a factor. Uh, the media center has definitely done a wonderful job in trying to keep the public informed, be it sports, be it news, be it a variety of topics, and I think they're a terrific asset in, in doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Riley County. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I first want to thank the Emergency Services Advisory Council. For people who are not familiar with that organization, uh, it is a, we've got 14 <coughs> fire stations in the county, 14 chiefs, 14 presidents of corporations, hundreds of volunteers and people working in those stations. And the ESAC is a place where you've got the volunteers represented, the stations, the union, you've got citizen representatives, the fire chief sits in it, and you've got, uh, you've got some amazing people running it in the name of uh, Rick Baker. So I sit on that advisory committee as the commissioner representative, and I just want to thank <coughs> each and every one of those individuals. We have, doc we have two doctors on the ESAC. Uh, it's an extraordinary group of people. And I want to thank them for all the work they're doing because there's only five of us and I just mentioned you know dozens and dozens of different entities out there and it allows us to make wise decisions they truly are focused and just trying to make the best decisions possible and then bringing them us to as commissioners and everybody knows what's going on in the county with the transition process taking place it is anything but simple uh, but the ESAC is playing such a critical role and I am so grateful for them and uh, I'm always looking forward to those meetings it's been mentioned we did meet with the Carroll <laughs> County, uh, the Carroll Community College Board of Trustees on Tuesday morning. It was a fantastic meeting and they had everybody on deck. So that was uh, really impressive. We have all benefited in some way or, or form or shape from that community college, whether we've got kids there or we've been there, or we went there ourselves or we have friends there, or we're trying to continue our education. So it's disheartening and this is my words, not theirs, but it, it's disheartening to see that our community college system in the state is going to, it looks like it's going to be another victim of what I like to refer to as state mandates. Uh, the state trying to tell counties and municipalities how to run their own governments. 
Uh, last week I mentioned, you know, the new motto for Maryland should be, if you don't like it too bad, because that is increasingly the case. Uh, the community college is one of those entities. We've already got a state board of education that's trying to tell our school board how to run their school system. And in the process, introducing some, introducing some draconian bills about what you should be teaching kindergartners and first graders about sexuality. We've got a public health commission coming down the road to tell our county health department how to run things. Uh, it seems like it's never ending. I know there's a lot of consternation about the upcoming budget for the school system. I'm encouraging parents, take a good look at Maryland Blueprint and what it's going to mean for our Carroll County public school system. That is coming straight out of Annapolis. And if I had a billion dollars, I may not be able to uh, negate some of the real negative effects of that blueprint coming down the pike. So um, again, I'll, I'll continue to speak on this because I think it's a disturbing development. It seems to be happening at ever increasing pace. We've got a fantastic county here. I mean, we do things right. We're not rich, but we're not, we're not poor. We just find ways to do things right. That's what we're all about. We shouldn't be penalized for it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a couple things. One, uh, last week, I think it was Thursday, um, the CCA came and uh, saw me, wanted to speak. I think there was like five or six of them. We had a very good, candid conversation uh, for about an hour, um, you know, talking about budget, talking about, you know, their priorities, ours. Um, and, you know, the, the key takeaway from me to them was continue to communicate, continue to uh, be a part of the process. You know, uh, same thing with CCPS and the Board of Education as we move forward. Um, it's not our budget, the five of us up here. It's not the government budget. It's the Carroll County budget. And we've got to commit ourselves to that. Um, and when I say budget, it's also resources, um, time, people, and money. And the second thing I just want to share, especially when it comes to uh, people and time, and that's uh, highlighting um, the sheriff and his department yesterday was uh, the school resource officer uh, recognition day, I believe. Um, again, like Commissioner Guerin said, nobody does it better than us. And uh, I, I've shared with other jurisdictions how they use their SROs um, and how they're seen. And it is so just uplifting when I can walk into a, a school and see a, an officer, a man or woman in, in blue and standing straight up and, you know, being, you know, the, the center of attention for so many students um, because they want to be around them as opposed to somebody in khakis and a, a polo shirt. That's not how we should uh, present ourselves. Um, so, you know, Sheriff, just uh, thank you for all you do uh, and your team, especially with the SROs and recognition. Um, and also uh, the work you did uh, and your department last week in a very difficult situation where it took uh, a region, you know, um, to take care of some nefarious uh, issues. Um, you know, bad people don't know boundaries. And uh, the good part is that our sheriff, along with, uh, I believe, the police forces in the region, um, have a wonderful uh, way of collaborating that is seamless, um, that is using uh, their tactics and techniques to ensure the safety and security of our community and to bring bad people to, uh, to justice um, and allowing us to know what goes on the whole time. So thank you. And, then, and it also goes for the men and women uh, you know, in red and uh, as we move forward with our fire EMS. You know, um, when I ran the installation, 80% of my fire calls were outside the fence line. So it's all about that mutual aid. It's all about that, that partnership. And uh, Sheriff, uh, you and your team have shown that partnership in the region. It makes us feel safe and secure. You have shown that partnership with the schools, with the SROs. And, uh, you know, just want to, uh, to recognize that. Um, so with that said, and I know you're going to want to say a few words about this, but let me um, let me pause that for a second. Let's get our legislative issues done, and then bring you up for a couple issues, if that's okay. Okay. 
Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Guerin, if you think it's bad from where you sit, come with me one day. <laughs> That's why we have you, Mike. I'll tell you. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, well, good morning. Good morning. So we are just a little over a month from crossover. That's the next big date. So the, the work on, on bills in committee has really kind of just begun. Uh, there haven't been many bills passed of any consequence. They've all been more or less technical, uh, state-related issues, sunset reviews, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to be getting into some serious stuff here very quickly. Um, so the governor's agenda has been put forward, his bills. Uh, you know, his, his agenda was attacking child poverty and uh, supporting veterans creating a, a program of service. So those bills have been introduced. Also, his appointments have been made. Uh, I think just about everybody now has <clears throat> been pushed through the Senate. Uh, I think there was some little controversy with the juvenile justice mm -hmm. uh, commissioner or, or director, uh, but that, that has passed through as well. So he has all of his people, uh, or will have all of his people in place very shortly. As far as the bills that, uh, that are directly related to us, the public facilities bond, while that is a, uh, a formality, frankly, we still keep a close eye on it because of how critical it is. So it, it did get out of uh, budget tax yesterday on the Senate side, and the House will hear that on the 21st. And then the bill that, uh, that we put forward late on uh, purchasing, uh, increasing the purchasing limit, uh, that actually has been dropped. It's Senate Bill 897. Uh, it will require a delegation meeting to put it forward, but uh, it, it sounds like they'll be fine with doing that. Uh, we, we will have to put an amendment in to change the, the title of the procurement officer, so that's not that big of a deal. Uh, a little bit of good news here and there. So the bill Senate Bill 225, that would have required PFAS monitoring in, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, wastewater treatment, has been withdrawn. And, and I think that was kind of doomed from the start. Uh, a lot of technical issues. I think the methodology isn't even approved yet by the EPA. So uh, that, along with we have a new uh, secretary of MDE. So I think we'll see that come back in some form next year, but it's off the table for, for now. Uh, a little bit of action on the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority dissolution. So that was in subcommittee. It's in the Environment and Transportation Committee in the House. The Environment Subcommittee uh, looked at that yesterday. The sponsor had offered a few amendments. We're glad we got a little bit of our concerns addressed. So one that we didn't address specifically, but it included the Maryland Clean Energy Center in, in the analysis and transition, and that's really not appropriate. So that's been moved. Uh, one amendment did insert uh, maintaining stakeholder engagement throughout the process. That was something we thought was important. And another one, and, and I've asked for a copy of the actual amendments because the, uh, the subcommittee meeting was on Zoom, and so you, all you know is what you hear. You don't get to see anything, actually. So it sounded like they're going to require the MES to temporarily assume all the functions, employees, and active contracts during the analysis, and then to maintain the assumption of those. So it sounds to me like what we suggested is if they do this, they should bring everything from, from the authority into MES intact. And it sounds like that's what's being proposed. But when I get those actual amendments and, and drill down, I'll, I'll let you know if that is in fact the case. Uh, just a couple of quick bills uh, in the education, uh, Senate Bill 881. So Retention has been an issue across, you know, just about every workforce. There was uh, there's a program to provide bonuses to child care providers that would have ended as of fiscal year 23. So this bill would extend it another 
additional two years, uh, which hopefully will help with retention there. And then uh, uh, House Bill 849, which the uh, Legislative Committee, MAKO Legislative Committee, considered yesterday, uh, would change the way enforcement is done on school buses. So, you know, the sacrosanct uh, aspect of not passing a school bus with flashing red lights, uh, currently there are fines associated with, uh, with citations there. And this bill would have removed the fines from the first and second violations. Uh, most of the people felt that that was probably inappropriate, that really the point is to prevent these things from occurring uh, beyond, beyond the, the first uh, infraction. So, uh, so the Legislative Committee voted to op oppose that. Mm -hmm. And, and this is uh, one of the things that's so depressing <clears throat> down there. I thought at first this was a, a county, one of the county's local bills for them, and that's bad enough, but it's statewide, correct? Correct. And I won't say the county, it obviously wasn't Carroll, the same <laughs> county that wants so much to make sure you guys in uniform are properly punished if you blow your nose in the wrong place, think somebody that commits a crime should only get a warning. I just, I don't understand the logic. I, I just truly don't. Yeah, it was challenging. <laughs> there, there was uh, a lot of sentiment in that regard. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it was a very interesting proposition, Frank. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned uh, Catherine Barry here last week, and uh, she, we're very fortunate that she is also the legislative liaison for the, the boards of elections around the state. So uh, she provided me with a number of bills that she believes would have an impact on Carroll County. Uh, she believes that they are probably not going to pass in their current uh, construction, but we're still going to keep an eye on them. So just quickly. House Bill 95 requires uh, some written and oral instructions for election judges to assist the elderly or disabled. It's very prescriptive, uh, all the way down to the size of the signs and the, the language in the signs. Uh, that's that's going to be a challenge. There's obviously a fiscal impact there. Uh, Senate Bill 39, uh, uh, affiliation. So right now, you can't if you're unaffiliated, you can't affiliate with a party beyond a, after registration closes. So I think it's 30 days uh, before the primary. Well, this bill would now allow you to change affiliation up to the day before the election. Obviously, creates a lot of challenges for them. They've got a lot on their plate, and they keep getting their plate loaded up. House Bill 22 has to do with signature requirements on absentee ballots, uh, would disallow the counting of an absentee ballot lacking a signature, and it requires the board to check each signature, cross-check it with, uh, with registration records. And then House Bill 35 is, uh, again, voter ID, which is not going to pass. The legislatures just seem to be dead set against that. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't require ID, it just adds uh, government issued ID as another way to check. It, it leaves in place asking someone their, I think, their birthday and their address, uh, but it also adds that as another aspect. But I don't see that moving forward at all. House Bill 41, curbside voting. Apparently, there are over 20 states that allow curbside voting. So essentially, it's it's really for disabled people and and pregnant women, or pregnant people, depending on your perspective. You can laugh at that. It's been there too long. It's terrible, isn't it? Just keep going. Uh, you have to adopt the language. But, um, so it, this is interesting because there's no check for this. You, the users, you know, you self-identify as a disabled person, and uh, so it requires the the board to set up some process where people can notify in advance that they'll be coming. Uh, and someone has to get to them relatively quickly and assist them with voting. Um, you can see how challenging that would be. You, and this has to be done at each early voting center, and then for the general election, it would have to be done at 
one location. And then the last one in Senate Bill 339 uh, has to do with recounts. Um, I think the local board has to take some actions that, again, are, are challenging to them and, and will have an impact. So I'll be following those pretty closely with her, make sure that, that we're covered there. And then lastly, uh, Senate Bill 45, I think uh, the sheriff would probably be happy to see this. This bill would have would have established a, a wide range of sort of protected classes on inmates and then prescribed separate housing for them. And you can see the challenge, particularly for the smaller rural counties that have smaller facilities, that that's just a real real challenge to provide this, this kind of separate housing. So that's been withdrawn by the sponsor. And Senate Bill 650, uh, this one we're, we're glad to see. Uh, our emergency management people and public works people are very happy to see it. It provides funding for local governments and, and citizens uh, when there is a disaster declared. Uh, but it applies when the state declares it, but when it's not a federal uh, declaration. So that will be funded with 20 million at the start of each fiscal year. Uh, so that's I think it's something we can be happy about. Um, and again, I've provided you with the list of bills that the Legislative Committee looked at uh, yesterday. And some of these, most of these positions go through as they are, but from time to time, some of these get changed after the discussions. Uh, so I haven't indicated, I think at least one or two of these probably mm -hmm. changed yeah. uh, before they went through. A question that, um, that obviously I don't understand, but I think everybody might like to hear at some point in time with most of these bills they come out with what the real cost is yes what's the timing of that is that um you know when does that happen and 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 that what made me think of it that changes sometimes the stance on something when you see who's paying for it and how much right the fiscal the fiscal notes will typically come out as quickly as they can when the, when the DLS sends out to various counties they don't send it out to every county but they'll send out to to various counties uh, to get the information on the bill back and then they include it in a uh, formal fiscal note um, they get attached on the website as soon as they're available so we can get in there and see what now they won't be down to the county level there'll be state government, private business, and local government. So you'll see what it costs the local governments collectively. Um, but the committee will always have the fiscal note when they're hearing the bill. So I can provide you fiscal notes <coughs> as they're available for any bill that you're interested in. And actually, we can, I can add these as they're available to the ones that I bring to you, sure. And I think Maybe not everyone, but the ones that are the more the significant, significant ones, yeah. right? Right. Yep. Thanks. There are some big ones, no question. Okay. Any other uh, comments? Good. Uh, good yeah, question. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. Again, uh, you know, if you're if you're somebody who's consider, concerned with election integrity, uh, you probably need to be paying attention to some of these election bills. Um, but particularly in one HB one one four, HB thirty five and forty one. I mean, if you had to handicap those, they, I would. I'm willing to guess they probably pass. Is that what I guess? Uh, 35, probably not. Well, ex yeah, 30, yeah, 35, no, that one's DOA. Right. 41, I, I'm not so sure. The curbside voting, yeah, I, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but that, I'm going to keep an eye on that because that's really a challenge. Yeah, I don't know how we're supposed to. Yeah, I mean, you, you heard from her last week, yeah, and exactly. you, you know the kind of challenges resource. she's got. Issue. Hey, they just keep piling it on and piling Absolutely. it on every year. It's a, how did we ever conduct elections in one day? We <laughs> <We> did. <laughs> it's amazing. For a long Start time. to finish. But you know, I, in, in point of personal privilege on this curbside voting, I mean, that, that's that's why absentee voting was expanded to the right. extent it has been. I don't know. What are we going to go to everybody's house now and collect? I don't the ballot? disagree with you. <laughs> so. that out loud. No, no. Okay. What else? That's all I have for you. Today. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Thank you so Good. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Sheriff, why don't you come on up here and let's talk about Cortico 
health and wellness app. Uh, and if you'd like to yeah, we'll visit comments. with a couple comments. Sure. So yeah, um, sure. Lieutenant Phil Lawrence is here. Oh. Um, don't worry. I, uh, so Phil oversees the safe schools unit for me. So um, he's the commander of it. Phil's got two very important jobs. He's also my SWAT team commander. And you mentioned that there were some things regionally that happened last week. Phil was sent over to Baltimore County. Um, with his team, which a number of them are actually SROs, so we were, were then having to backfill um, our SROs because they, they would have to come out of the schools and run with Phil East. Um, two Baltimore County police officers were shot. Um, the first um, was shot during a call um, that a father had called in saying his son was suicidal. And the officers got into the house and um, random shots rang out. One of the officers was hit. Um, he has since been released. And that began a massive search for uh, the suspect, and he was on the loose from that point. We have such a wonderful relationship with Baltimore County and the region police departments. When things like this happen, um, it takes literally an army to, to come help them. And so uh, we're one of the first calls Baltimore County makes, asks for our team to come down and assist with, uh, with searching for that individual. So Phil takes the team down there. And, and as you know, uh, uh, several hours later or in, into the next day, another uh, police officer was shot. Um, how he survived, I don't know. Um, he is still in very bad shape, but it does appear as though um, he will survive. Um, that, that incident then took off from there and went up into Hartford County where the individual was, um, was stop-sticked by Hartford County Sheriff's Office. They did a wonderful job with a number of teams to, to pin that fellow down and, and take him into custody without any shots being fired when, when what took place earlier was remarkable. So Phil really does a great job for me. Um, he's got two big responsibilities, the schools and, and our SWAT team. And, and last week, he really um, got work over because we had an incident at, at Northwest Middle, al albeit it wasn't on the campus, but uh, right. y y if you'd have fallen down, you'd have hit the campus when, when this incident happened. Um, and you're right, the school resource officers do a wonderful job. And, and I want to recognize them. They're not here. It's school today. So they got to be in the schools. Phil, Phil's the only one I could pull out of the schools, but um, they do a wonderful job. Sergeant Snedden's over at uh, Gateway. Corporal Jeremy Holland is over at the Tech Center. Corporal Rex Scott's over at East Middle. And as I walk around the county, Paul Cox is up at uh, Northwest. Um, Clint Cromwell is over at Francis Scott Key High School. Mm -hmm. Um, when you go to the northern part of the county, Kyle Bargett's over at Manchester Valley. Very popular guy at Manchester. Clint Cromwell's more popular than Bargett, he <laughs> says. Cromwell's a graduate of FSK and is now back there. Um, as you come to the center part of the county, um, Shanita Blackwell's at uh, Winters Mill. Pete Dregesser is over at uh, Westminster High. Um, again, Rex is at, at, at East Middle. As you go to the southern part of the county, John Welty is over at Oklahoma Road Middle School. Um, Jessica Snyder, who is actually the face of our organization right now, you see her on the billboards mm -hmm. as you navigate around the county, is at Liberty High School. Um, as you go a little further west, uh, Kyle Merson's over at uh, South Carroll High School, and helping down south is uh, Brian Puff. Um, he's down at the, that Mount Airy and, and, and helps service those schools. And Century. Ah, uh, DeMont. How can I forget DeMont? <laughs> DeMont, um, <laughs> he owns Century High School. Exactly. Um, DeMont Harvey is at at Century High School, and um, I, I can throw his face out every month and, and get thousands of comments on him. He, he is such a good good guy, and they all do just spectacular work, and I think the comment was that they do more than just um, protect the lives of the, the kids there, and that's their primary responsibility, don't get me wrong, but they are really a part of the fabric of each school that they that they go to and, and work out of and, and do just absolutely remarkable work. And we make sure that we put the right people at the right school based on the personality of the deputy, the personality of the school. Um, and I will mention that Scott Lavender is the principal out at Northwest. And um, when that incident happened out there, Paul Cox happened to be on the campus when it happened. It was at dismissal. And so um, they, they did a wonderful job. They absolutely did a wonderful job. The, the students were actually leaving the school the pathway that would, uh, that the majority, I think Scott tells me that there's about 200 kids that walk to that school. Um, they would have been going out towards East Baltimore Street on that path and a uh, clear sight from the school. Um, any, it could have gone really, really bad, but mm -hmm. they did a wonderful job throwing all their pro protocols into place and getting the kids back on, 
onto the uh, property and, and into the buses. And one of the bus patrol things that we'll discuss after Cortico kind of came into play in this particular incident. Some of the technology that bus patrol provided us came into play. And I've got Mike Hardesty here from, from Carroll County Public Schools, and we'll explain how that, that really worked out for us with knowing where our buses were and being able to communicate when an incident like that took off. So. I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's great. This is what needs to be in the paper. This is the information that needs to be shared. The ability to collaborate, the ability to fund appropriately, the ability to, um, to work seamlessly, you know, within the community. We say it, nobody knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans, and that's what this is all about. Um, so just, and I'm gonna open up for my colleagues, but Lieutenant, let me give you a coin on behalf of your SROs, so. Let, let me say this, you guys didn't wait, by the way, for legislation to take place in order to fund the SROs. Um, the previous board funded SROs, regardless of what was coming out of the state. So um, you guys were at the forefront of putting these men and women, and a, and a very diverse group of men and women in our, in our schools. So yeah. um, you, didn't, you didn't mess around with it, which was, which was a good idea. And then you also mentioned, um, we, we look like this every day when we go in. Um, we, we don't dress down. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, when, when something happens like Northwest Middle, we've gotta be ready to fight and we've gotta have the tools that are needed to fight and protect the, the students and staff at each school. And I will not allow them to wear anything other than what I'm wearing and what Phil has on and what the deputies wear in and out of the schools. Dressing down to look softer doesn't wash with me at all. I won't, won't have that. So. I agree. Uh, anyone? And, and I think that's, that's so great because we've got so many kids getting very comfortable with somebody in full uniform. And I, I think that's a giant step for these kids. But then mm -hmm. the turn side of that, which we've seen a little bit at, at carnivals, at other events, when an SRO is out in the community in plain clothes, kids recognize oh, yeah. him or her and run up to him and talk to him. It, it's, a, it's impressive. I was walking around with Deputy Harvey, I think last year, and he literally walks down the hallways like this. Yeah. Um, and even the teachers come out and high five him. And a, a girl walked up to us and she saw me in a uniform and the stars and the bars and that mean not, means nothing to them. And the girl says, do, do, is Harvey one of your deputies? Does, do, do you work for Harvey? <laughs> and I thought, well, you know what? Yeah, I, I kind of do. Yeah, I do. So yeah. he's the sheriff of Century High. I, I think the other important part of it, too, and going off what Commissioner Kyler has said and what Commissioner Rothstein has said, is that, you know, I, long before I was in this position, I was hearing positive things about the SRO program, nothing but positive things. And, you know, in addition to, to getting, you know, kids used to authority, getting them used to, to dealing with law enforcement, right, in a very positive way, uh, you know, it helps to, to change a sociocultural reality. I mean, we're dealing with, with, a, with such a disgusting anti-police mentality nationally right now. And so anywhere that we are able to do good and to, to back law enforcement is incredibly important. And I, I certainly am going to continue to, to support the SRO program. Um, because again, you know, you're, you're changing hearts and minds and you really are creating the groundswell conditions for a change about a national mentality. And I cannot thank you guys enough for doing that. Appreciate yep. and, and one last comment. Y you initiated it well before you had to, and, and that's super, but as nationwide tragedies or other things happen that you think a change is warranted, that happens so quickly. And, mm -hmm. and you know the program's always adjusting and it's a great program it doesn't have to adjust much but when necessary you take care of it we do and we've right. seen that um, and I rely on Phil I rely on Curtis Pierce from the um, school security side to, to help us with making those adjustments and um, issues that may be going out uh, going on at a particular school that may need more attention by us and, and that that process has worked and the other part of it too is just knowing that there is someone in the schools who will be able to protect the students immediately. God forbid something ever happens. Okay. Anything else? I uh, just want to make a comment along with the fellow commissioners. Thank you all for what you do in law enforcement. I know some days it's not as appreciated by some, but we all greatly appreciate it. Um, I will share one little fun tidbit from a couple years ago. Uh, to the sheriff's point, you know, you all are in uniform. 
had a dear friend that her young son at the time was uh, very enamored with law enforcement, very young, young age, and uh, there was a, a deputy someplace, and uh, it was near the house, so he, you know, just happened to be in the area, there was nothing going on, but a young man had to go in, his hou- in the house and get his, his hat and his badge because he wanted to go out and and talk to the deputy so i know there's days that you have people that are less than pleasant to deal with but i can tell you there's definitely youth that looks up to you and and appreciates all that you do so i just want to say thank you appreciate it okay um and i have a a maureen's here i have a a, an agenda item before we get into a presentation okay good morning commissioners good morning (laughs) morning back to work (laughs) <laughs> I suppose. Hey, um, the board previously approved grant funding for the Carroll County Sheriff's Office to pay Cortico Incorporated to provide a customized mobile health and wellness app for the agency. This program began in 2021, and we are now requesting your approval to renew the annual subscription cost of um, $30,000. The subscription fee covers the licensing, the maintenance, and the ongoing updates and the unlimited use by Carroll County Sheriff's Office personnel. This amount is covered by an awarded grant and has been approved by the Budget Office and no additional funds should be necessary. And I'll turn it over to the Sheriff's and Vicki if you have any questions. So you guys uh, approved this um, last year mm-hmm. uh, and, and it is an app that's on all of the deputies' phones and including mine and they have access to the app and it does it uh, goes the gamut of, of uh, resources for wellness um, to tips to down to, to um, uh, clergy if that's what's needed, um, other resources on the app. So we've found a, a lot of uh, uh, benefits from, from that particular app, and it is a grant-funded program. Okay. Is there any value in doing multi-year or no? You can't. I don't know that I don't think we can. Are. I think that's something that comes out of the I believe I have out. asked in the past. Yeah. I will definitely check again. Okay. I think in the past the reason is it has moved between different grants. Right. Um, with any grant they never know, but I can tell you the grant that it is in now, there is supposed to be additional funding for the next few years. So that may be an opportunity to okay. now go back and ask. Just, just check into absolutely. it. Absolutely. We did initially save, but save a dollar, that's a oh, good thing. Absolutely. So Okay. Is this uh, is it scalable? If at some point we decided we wanted to extend its use to firefighter EMS, or, or any, is it is it even applicable, or is it more designed for um, law enforcement? It's a good question. Um, I would say there would be additional items to add. Um, I would say in a public safety concept, because of mental health and wellness, it is designed, I'm sure, for some of the features for law enforcement, but it obviously overlaps. <clears throat> um, we'd have to see. I. I that's something we could explore, we could Commissioner. I don't, I don't think that's a bad idea as the fire department yeah. gets bigger and broader. They're going to use the same yeah. resources in a lot of ways that we are crossing mm-hmm. over, so it's a good question. It's something we never even thought about. But, but uh, I, I would appreciate, yeah. I would appreciate Absolutely. that. I think we all, yeah. yeah, that'd be, mm-hmm. thank you Absolutely. for that offer. Okay. Is there a motion? I move that the Board of Commissioners approve the, um, the annual subscription cost of $30,000 to Cortico, Inc. to maintain the health and wellness law enforcement app for the Sheriff's Office. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this one? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's Thank talk you. about a bus patrol program. Um, Phil, if you want to come up. Mr. Artis. Thanks, Maureen. If you're okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, do I have access to... I do. Okay. Would you mind running that for me, Phil? Sure. So um, I got a request about a month ago to go over the bus patrol program. Um, I created a PowerPoint presentation that uh, Lieutenant Lawrence will walk through. Lieutenant Lawrence oversees that. Sergeant Russ Taranjo is here. Um, he's got all the, the details because he primarily with his group um, are looking at the citations that come in daily and has a lot of the intricacies and then of course Mike Hardesty with the, is the director of transportation for Carroll County Public Schools um, so any question that needs to be answered I, I think we'll we'll be able to get it answered um, so the first slides the law um, and and we put out an awful lot annually when it comes to um, public service announcements with this is the law when you come up on a school bus 
And so we, we try and target it, obviously, in, in August and around the time that folks know that buses are going to come back out on the road. And I'll do public service announcements on TV, cable TV, uh, the radio, whatever, whatever is possible in order to make sure people understand what the responsibility is when they come up on a bus. With that being said, and I don't want to be brutal about this, but it is not my responsibility to teach people how to drive. It is the responsibility of the person driving that vehicle to understand what the law is when they come up on a stop sign or, or a big yellow bus. Um, that is taught very early, and it's something when in doubt you should stop. And so there's the transportation article that deals with it. Mm -hmm. The biggest issue always tends to be a divided highway or a roadway that has a median strip. A good example would be uh, Route 26 in Eldersburg. It's got a, um, it's got a, div it's divided in the center there for a turn lane, but it doesn't have an actual barrier like right. a Jersey wall. And that always seems to be ambiguous for people. Should I stop? Should I not stop? And so we try and put as much education as we can when it comes to, to the law out there. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the person driving in the vehicle. And I'll show you an example of something like this as we, as we go along, I'll show you a video where um, that takes place. So the contract itself, um, kind of the way it came about, uh, the, the Board of Education approached me. They wanted to go to um, this system or a system that was like it um, in order for the entire system to be put into the, to the buses. There needed to be cooperation between law enforcement, Carroll County Public Schools, and then, of course, the Board, board of Commissioners. So um, we, went in, we entered into a contract, or Carroll County Public Schools did, um, in, in June of 2020, and the first violation for the bus arms started um, September 1st, 2020. And so um, bus patrol, um, at no cost to Carroll County at all, to the public school system or to the Board of Commissioners, upfitted every single bus in, in the Board of Education's fleet with this technology. When Mike and I were starting to look at it, at this, and I think Mr. Guthrie was on board then, there, was, there were companies that were coming in that wanted to do a sampling of school buses. They wanted to do 50 or 75 buses, and really it wasn't adequate for us, so, so we didn't want to do anything that didn't have every single bus upfitted. And, and, and there was a reason for that, because the technology on that bus isn't just for the stop arm systems. There's other things that Mr. Hardesty and his staff, including mine, benefit from, and I'll explain that as we, as we move on. So 307 buses are currently uh, equipped with the technology, um, and that fluctuates annually according to what Mr. Hardesty and his staff needs out there. Um, so there's uh, a number of cameras on there and, and multiple cameras. Um, the, the most um, noticeable camera would be the one that runs along the driver's side that kind of kind of runs the contour of the bus and those are the primary cameras that pick up the uh, school bus violation it also has gps system for fleet tracking and then there's first net wireless communications it's a platform so that they have two-way communications and the reason i say that that was that is probably as beneficial as any part of this entire system is because last week Mr. Hardesty is, a, is able to communicate immediately with the buses that are going to Northwest, whether to divert them and keep them away from the school um, through two-way communication or through the GPS system, or to get them to the school faster so that we can evacuate it and move them to another location, or he could divert other bus buses to Northwest Middle so that we could get, take them to a staging location if, if buses couldn't get on the compound. The, the system is just really remarkable and the ability to, be, to communicate. Previously, there could be an incident that takes place out on the streets in Carroll County with a bus and um, the ability to find that bus could be, could be challenging. Now we know exactly where the bus is and we can respond to any incident that may take place on the bus. It could also be a weather event and Mr. Hardesty can relocate those buses based on the GPS locations and the two-way communications with the bus. So um, there's a lot of value in the total package of the equipment, but in order for the stop arms to be a part of the system, you have to have the total package within, within the system. Um, it's a five-year contract. Um, so this is the, this is the um, I guess, the money piece of it. 
So, so we didn't pay any money to, to, to upfit any of these buses, and we don't pay any money for monthly fees for technology fees. So the equipment's one thing that went into these buses, and then the technology fees of cloud-based storage, of folks reviewing uh, citations on their end, um, the technology for GPS locations, everything that goes into that bus um, costs about 138000 monthly um, and and you can do the math it, it, uh, Mike and I looked at it it's about um, eight and a half million dollars in technology for a five-year period um, it's not cheap so the initial cost of the technology that went into the bus and then the the monitoring fees and all the fees that go associated with uh, managing that technology costs about a hundred and thirty thousand dollars a month for all the buses in the fleet. Um, so kind of, I'll give you the enforcement statistics. Uh, we launched this in 2020 and during the pandemic and, and it, um, nobody could have predicted and it was not the, the best time, but nonetheless, it was launched during that time, 152 citations were issued in 2020. And then you can see the numbers as they go up in 2021 and now in 2022. 7,215. Um, so when we look at the enforcement statistics and, and start looking at violations, um, at, at the end of 2022, the Sheriff's Office has viewed 12,900 violations with an overall rating of 72.9%. So we, we do not approve every citation that comes through here. Bus Patrol sends us what the law says is a violation it is our responsibility and my staff's responsibility to go through each individual citation and make a determination whether that was a legitimate violation in order to process. If we sign off on that and we have 10 days, I think in another slide, it'll say we have 10 days from the time that that citation shows up in our system to approve or disapprove the citation. If we approve it, then Bus Patrol sends that citation so that it gets a district court hearing if, if that's what they choose, but it then sends the citation to the owner of the vehicle, um, not the particular driver, it's a civil violation. So 72.9% um, and as we started talking about this, uh, Lieutenant Lawrence and I started looking around what, it, what the other counties that have bus patrol or systems like this and we're pretty consistent with um, the other counties when it comes to uh, the approval rate or disapproval rate of, of citations. It, we, run, we run pretty close to, to what, what goes on regionally. Um, less than 3% repeat offenders, so there's a lot of, the, is this working? Are we changing driving behaviors? So the recidivism rate for folks that are being stopped in this county is less than 3%. Um, what we do see um, from time to time are, um, for example, enterprise rental cars, uh, vehicles that are that are being leased where a liability would have to be transferred um, so we do see a number of them where people think that they're absolved of their responsibility because they're in a rental vehicle and they're not and they sign lease agreements that say if you don't pay the citation then we're just going to charge your credit card so those are some things that are a little quirky to come through but bus patrol is pretty good at figuring those out and we can gather statistics on on those issues um, and that's just another uh, another slide on enforcement. So we this is legislated. Um, there was friendly legislation that needed to be to be applied for and, and sought before this program took place. <coughs> legislation allows us to to um, set fines. Um, in this case, we set the fine to two hundred fifty dollars. We could have set it to um, five hundred dollars, I believe, or somewhere to. In, in that realm and just so you understand this is a civil violation that has no points attached to it if one of my deputies were witnessing the same violation it would be five hundred and twenty dollars and three points assessed to the driver of the vehicle themselves so there's a significant difference in in the the amount of money and and the fines when an individual when we process it and an individual gets a citation this is what they get and then there is the ability to view real-time video not real-time but video of the actual infraction so they can go on and see exactly um, what they did or who was in the vehicle at the time 
um, and, and, and track it down. But uh, they give several different images, still, still photos, and then video of the actual violation itself. And then this is, a, um, this is over on John Street. Upper left is the yellow lights. They've been on for a while. Upper left is the red lights. They come on immediately, stop sign out. Kids are coming on, and that vehicle comes straight through. That is a typical violation that we see regularly. Um, I'll show it to you again. The reason that the, uh, the upper left hand really helps us out because I can tell you when the bus driver initiates <coughs> the yellow mm -hmm. lights to start warning people. And then the bus driver stops, signs come out, and then, and then the, the, that is just an obvious clear violation and that's what we see um, more than not, that's what we see. Um, the, the stop arms that come out, the stop signs that come out to the side of the bus, that, that's, not, that's not what the transportation article talks about. The transportation article talks about the, the red lights that are coming on the front and the back of the bus. Um, they come on instantly once the, the driver throws them on. The stop arms are hydraulic and they take, the stop uh, sign itself is hydraulic and that takes a second to get out. Sometimes we get people that will argue, well, the stop sign wasn't completely out. We can see exactly where you're at when, that, when those red lights come on and how long the caution lights were on. And Mike and his staff do a wonderful job within service educating school bus drivers um, on, on exactly what they should be doing. There's a lot of people that'll come in and say, um, well, the bus driver was waving me on. Um, and, and that does happen periodically. Um, if that does happen, it should be done under caution, not, not red light, um, because once the red lights come on and something passes it, it's, it's clicking and it's writing, it's sending citations to us. So we, we do work with Mike and his staff regularly and the school bus drivers to make sure that they understand how the system works. He has new bus drivers every year that he's got to go through, not unlike I've got new police officers that I've got to, to train and, and get better, but we work closely and understand the citations that are coming through to make sure that we're not sending over citations to the court system that we don't believe are, are citations that can be, can be won in court. Um, we do have a number of folks that go to court. Um, of the amount of citations that I, I sent, I, I told you about 4% of the violators request court. Um, 138 of those paid before they even got to court. Um, and then the overwhelming majority were found uh, guilty um, and 25 violators were found not guilty. And we learned that early on. Um, specifically, there's two district court judges. Periodically, there's visiting judges that come in and out of the, the courthouses, but Judge Lewis and Judge Dans primarily see these citations. And a lot of it is learning um, what is acceptable to them um, when it comes to what they believe is, a, is an obvious infraction or an obvious uh, violation of the law. And so working through the district courts and understanding that and, and being able to supply them with the exact vid video. Um, and then 10 were a transfer liability, which was the uh, least court, um, uh, the least companies. Um, and here's, here's just another statistical data. Um, they can vary the violations. They don't have to go with our 250. If you, if you just pay the violation out before you go to court, that's one thing. They can increase it if they choose to. Um, sometimes they do based on the video that they see um, and it causes them to do it a, a, a little higher um, citation fee. And then um, the last is just a, an, another overview of the technology, um, what we're paying annually. And I will tell you that there is a $1.85 million deficit right now in the technology fee that we will never catch up with. And you scratch your head at that, and, and here's the reason. Um, we don't write or approve enough citations for it to, it to keep up with the, the technology fee. Again, the amount of equipment that was installed and then the, then the monthly fees in order to maintain that equipment and the technology, uh, we just simply aren't keeping up with that and 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 that's a Mike Hardesty Cindy McCabe issue um, that they are working with with my staff on but um, th this is a valuable valuable system and so what we feel that 
that it needs to be there. The, the bus patrol is working with us on that on that technology fee. Um, one of the questions I've, I get often is, do I have the staff to do this? Um, we we fill my staff that's behind me look at student safety from door to door, um, from the time they get on a bus, and maybe even standing outside at a bus stop while they're in school, and from the time we drop them back off at their home. This this bus patrol plays a a key role in making sure that there's a lot of safety um, getting them back and forth um, and then the SROs play a key role once they get there so we were willing to take on the burden the second that it happened knowing that that we would not be compensated so um, early in the in the project so kind of the way it works is that if the technology fee the hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars a month was met anything over that hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars would then have a profit sharing to it. 60, 40 profit sharing, I think 60, our office, 40 bus patrol, Board of Education got nothing. Um, but that, that fee has not been met. So we, we, we aren't even close to that. So um, this was never about making money, ever. I knew we weren't gonna make money. I knew the return on the investment wasn't gonna be immediate or probably even the time that I was sheriff. Um, but it didn't matter to us, we wanted to make sure that um, we, we were 360 when it came to student safety, and this plays a key role in that. One last, for instance, um, we used bus patrol in the northern part of the county. Um, I think it was back around Thanksgiving a few years ago when we had a pipe bomb that was mailed to an individual's house. Um, believe it or not, a bus patrol and a school bus picked up on one of the multi-cameras that they have, that vehicle um, leaving, leaving the area. Um, so we do use and we will call Mike's crew and, and Curtis to, to see if there's video footage that we can use that, that it may be around the bus, not necessarily involving the bus, that help us solve crime. So overall, we, we like the system. The, the um, issue is going to be for Mr. Hardesty and, and uh, Cindy to, to figure out the, the contractual part of it. But we want it. We like it. We're capable of handling the, the work that comes in. I don't need any more resources to do it. Um, and if there's some profit at the end of it, great. We've already said it. There's profit that comes to my office that'll be used for school safety. I'm not used to hearing that. I don't need any more resources <laughs> to do it. I, I, just, I, I'm, I'm just, no, let me let I've already let, got let, your let wallet. I got that in. before you even sat down. I just want to let that sink in. <laughs> Uh, wow. We just play that as a continuous That is loop. a first. I'll be in next week, so just clear your mind. I don't need any more resources. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the, uh, for the briefing. Any uh, comments, yeah, questions? I think I'd, I'd like to make a comment, um, a couple comments. One, I loved all the percentages. I was wondering about how many try to go to court. Again, this makes it more idiotic that somebody thinks they should get a warning first time when, when you see the levels that this go through before somebody gets a fine. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and you alluded to it a little bit, but another group that's been cooperating throughout this entire process has been the bus contractors and the drivers. This, this meant early on equipment had to be installed in their buses and, and uh, you know they needed training and and everybody worked together to make that happen and it's you know I look at it you know if the county came to me and said oh we need to install this on your dash because you're a commissioner I'd throw a fit <laughs> and you know everybody worked together you throw a fit never <laughs> never um, but they all work together and I'm sure there was some pushback and sure there were some training issues but they've cooperated in this too and I think I think they're seeing now the benefit to it I mean, Mike organized all this, and we used the Ag Center to yeah. to run everything through. So please, right. yeah. Uh, thank you, C Commissioner. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Good morning. Yeah, we're <clears throat> we're very pleased with the overall uh, bus patrol contract. Um, obviously, there's some things to work out with uh, the technology fees, and one of the things that really hurt us in terms of what we uh, owe them still according to the contract but I should make the point we really don't owe them anything at the end of the contract we are free and cleared uh, to walk away without owing them anything despite um, you know what we what we see as a technology deficit right now 
but we we lost a whole year. The contract was initiated in June of 2020, and then we lost a whole year with COVID and, and schools not not starting as as normal. Uh, and even into the 21 year, uh, we didn't see the number of motorists on the road that you would normally see. But even uh, while those buses were parked during that year, we were still racking up the technology fee. They 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 yeah, yes. still right. So so we are. Uh, Bus Patrol is very interested in, in renegotiating the terms, and, and we are too. Um, so we have a meeting with them actually next week, which might give us a better opportunity uh, for some revenue share, even though, as, as Sheriff DeWeese said, we didn't get into this looking for any money. The school system never wanted any money in this. But I want to make sure that the sheriff is taken care of for his administrative costs in some fashion. Uh, obviously, the whole program from Bus Patrol standpoint or our standpoint hinges on the sheriff and their, their, uh, their work with this and making sure that uh, the tickets are prosecuted. You know, prior to uh, the bus patrol agreement, um, we participated every year for about a 12-year period uh, statewide with a one-day snapshot of violations, of stop arm violations. Um, and, and our average, as reported by bus drivers, was about 92 on that one day. Uh, look at things and across the state and across the country it's a tremendous problem with uh, motorists violating the law so we knew it was a serious problem and uh, so bus patrol you know assures us that wherever buses go and we have 9,000 bus stops roughly every day um, so you know we're assured that these cameras are on every single bus and we have the technology that we need for safety and security purposes with live GPS and uh, in interior cameras um, and our push to talk communication devices, as Sheriff DeWee said, are just, just such an improvement over what we had, which was a hodgepodge of cell phones. So we can get a message out to, all, to the entire fleet or any portion of the fleet, any type of emergency that arises, as Sheriff DeWee said with Northwest Middle last week, it was invaluable uh, to have that technology. There are times, um, we talked about this this morning, where we notice um, maybe bus stops or intersections that may be a high frequency and um, just an unusual on-ramp or off-ramp and and so Phil or the guys will communicate with Mike and and they'll evaluate a particular stop if it if it can be moved it is if it can't be then that's just that's just how it is but we notice and communicate back and forth with Mike and the staff and bus patrol on some of those issues so it isn't this it's hard and fast this is how it is it's it's a system that we we talk about regularly and try and massage if we need to and and you mentioned all the cameras and i don't know how much sometimes with security you don't want to bear your soul to the world but how valuable are the cameras inside <coughs> the bus extremely valuable yeah. commissioner um almost every day at least one school is requesting video based upon something that happened on the bus um so um it, you know, it, it, it's a tremendous, a tremendous amount of requests that come in for interior camera video. Uh, and I think you, you, you're asking a question because it's, you know, the answer and they're, they're extremely valuable. Um, there, there's things that, that uh, substantiate and there's things that exonerate mm -hmm. um, allegations that take place. And so the video inside of those, those buses are extremely, extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Comments, thoughts? Can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. sure. I'm just curious. I saw this exact same thing on um, Route 26 just a couple weeks ago. So the bus was stopped picking up children on the north side of 26. It was going mm -hmm. westbound. And um, and I was a couple cars behind it. And um, a car just um, pulled out from in front of me and went into the yeah. um, suicide, lane. Dead, suicide lane yeah. and um, went around them. Now he was he or she was two or three lanes away i'm just curious would the cameras actually pick mm -hmm. that up it does well enough to identify it does. good yeah. and the video to it yeah and that is uh, we talked about 26 this morning i mean there's not that many four lane roads in the county so mm -hmm. it's pretty 140 um once you get uh west of of you know westminster is is two lane but 140 has a barrier and, it, and we don't have many stops there but right. there are stops along 26 um, 32 going south um, towards Howard County and and but that do not have they have the center lane but they don't have a barrier and 
Um, that's the education piece, but you have got to stop. And those cameras will pick you up. And the video is, you saw the video, it's pretty sophisticated. Even if it's a car that comes right by the bus or if it's several lanes over, it'll pick it up for us and give us the, the information. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Well, thank, thank you. you very thank much. you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Ms. Steckel, why don't you come on up here with Ms. Yates, and I think, Paul, you come up as well. Tell about the annual plan for fiscal year 2023. Carroll County Bureau of Housing to be displayed for public comment for a 45-day period. And it's based on federal regulation, <coughs> but I'm not going to get into that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. Okay. Okay. All right. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm joined this morning uh, by da Danielle Yates. She's our Bureau Chief of Housing and Community Development. And then also Paul Moffitt. He is our manager um, of our housing uh, program. Um, you, as the Board of County Commissioners, serve as our governing body of our public housing authority and our annual plan that we're required to review. Um, and that's why we're here before you today. Each year, we look at some of the, the changes that could be made to our plan to make us a better housing authority, to be more reflective of how we're actually operating our housing authority. Um, and this year is no different. Um, we have, throughout the past year, come up with some, some different differences in the program um, implemented some changes and we want to reflect those in our, our annual plan. So this morning I'm here with Danielle who's going to walk us through some of those changes um, but just to give you some statistics we currently have 796 housing choice vouchers. Of those vouchers we have some different types of vouchers so 100 of those are non-elderly disabled vouchers, 33 are family unification program vouchers, 15 of those are our HUD VASH vouchers, our Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing vouchers, 119 are our mainstream vouchers, and 529 of those are tenant-based tenant rental vouchers. Um, <clears throat> the process that we're initi initiating here today uh, with you will formalize the recommended changes and allow the pu public to comment and review the changes um, that we are making today. So I'm going to turn this over to Danielle to walk us through. We have five different changes we're recommending. Um, and if you have questions, uh, you can either hold them till the end or ask away as we're presenting. Um, go ahead, Danielle. So good morning, commissioners. Good morning. As Celine noted, we're here to discuss the changes to our fiscal year 23 annual plan. Um, there are five adjustments that we have recommended. Our first can be found in Chapter 4, which is Applications, Waiting List, and Tenant Selection. We have made an adjustment to our Special Admissions Selection. Um, we have adjusted the number of referrals that we receive from our family shelter from serving two households annually to five, and we have designated five vouchers as part of our move-on strategy for our disconnected, rapid rehousing youth. We have also made an adjustment in Chapter 12, which is moves with continued assistance and portability. We have adjusted language to restrict porting, which is the process of moving from one public housing authority's jurisdiction to another. Mm -hmm. Households will not be permitted to exercise portability within the first year of tenancy when leasing up with our housing authority. Our final adjustments can be found in Chapter 15, <coughs> which is program integrity. We have adjusted the maximum length of time that a repeat repayment agreement can be used to up to 36 months. Previously, the maximum length was 24 months or two years. We have also attempted to more clearly identify when a repayment agreement is considered in default. We have done this by indicating that if a payment is not made within the last working day of the month, it will be considered missed and if there are three missed periods in a 12-month period in total, this will place that repayment agreement into default for further action and collection. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions you may have or can we clarify some of the changes that we're making <coughs> here? Are there any questions? Yeah. No. 
I did want to add um, just a little detail about Carroll County's Housing Choice Voucher Program, uh, which I don't know that everyone understands. One of the things that we serve, um, the, the population that we serve here in Carroll with our Housing Choice Vouchers, um, right now we are at 99% utilization of folks that are either older adults or disabled individuals. Um, I think that sometimes people have a misconception about um, the population served by Housing Choice Voucher Programs, and in Carroll County, we are serving those folks most in need, um, our vulnerable individuals. So I just wanted to make that clear. And one other thing is just to, to make sure folks are aware also that <clears throat> this is a continuum of our housing solutions in Carroll County. And so when we talk about the, ch the changes that we're recommending here, we don't do this in a vacuum just with the Bureau of Housing. We, we meet with our COC, we talk with the Executive Committee, we have subcommittees of the Executive Committee of the COC, the Continuum of Care for homeless, Homelessness, um, where we, we talk about how we're, we're not meeting the needs and how can we do it better. Um, and, and part of the recommendations with these vouchers um, is to make those changes that the team has identified. And this is the whole county comes together to, to help us with this process. And in extension to that, we also have what is called a resident advisory board, where we actually have landlords and participants of our program that we meet regularly with and we discuss the changes. So we make sure we're getting input from those who are actually being affected by the changes within the program as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. and. Um the integrated approach that you do have. Um, I don't know if you've come in front of us to walk us through the continuum of care um, process, and that may be something of uh, value for uh, myself and colleagues. Um, the importance of it and also a little bit of um, brain power from us on what may be missing um, or what may be duplicate, duplicative um, where we can, you know, save resources, but where are the gaps and redundancies and duplication? Um, you do a great job with it, and you know how I feel about that. Um, but I think there's value just for uh, just for information to us because it is a very valuable tool that we have in Carroll County. Again, where Carroll Countyans take care of our community, so. Um, yeah, just we'll we'll figure out a time, but sure. you know, just put it on. I would love to. So with that though, um, need a motion for this administrative plan to stay uh, available for 45 days. I move the board of commissioners approve the display of the annual plan for 45 days for public review and comment, and announce a public hearing prior to the April 6, 2023, to consider approval to submit the FY 23 annual plan to HUD. Okay. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We now are going to move into a public hearing regarding the rezoning case number 228, Eldersburg Investors 2 LLC. Burke, did you want to get us started on this? Or? Yes, good morning. This is a public hearing to uh, consider a piecemeal rezoning request. Uh, it is a, uh, a hearing which will be first hearing from our department planning, and then we'll be hearing from the uh, developer, the applicant. So at this point, maybe we'll turn it to uh, our department planning. And then also, if there's public here, if there's any public comment today, please fill in a comment card and hand it to uh, Mrs. Windham. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, we are here before you today, as Mr. Burke said, for rezoning case 228, Eldersburg Investors, LLC. This is um, similar to the case that you heard a few weeks ago, again, where it was a piecemeal rezoning. It'll be the same process and procedure as you did in that case as well. Um, Hannah Weber is with me today, and she is the staff person who put together the staff report and the Planning Commission report. So with that, I'm going to have Hannah go ahead and introduce the case to you. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Getting started, um, as you can see, we're here for a public hearing for rezoning case 228, Eldersburg Investors 2 LLC. 
As always, this public hearing was advertised. You can see here the ad that ran in the Carroll County Times. There was also signage posted along Maryland 26 on the frontage of the property. And then we also sent letters out to adjoining property owners notifying them of today's hearing. Getting into the details, locating ourselves, we are inside the Freedom Designated Growth Area in Commissioner District 5. The petitioned area is located across from Liberty Exchange on the south side of Maryland 26. The petitioned area is four separate parcels, and those four parcels are totaling 12.47 acres. All four parcels are currently zoned C2 commercial medium, and the request is to rezone all four parcels to C3 commercial high. The applicant is arguing that there is a mistake in the current zoning and that a substantial change in the character of the neighborhood has occurred. So since a change in the neighborhood argument is being used, we had to establish a neighborhood boundary in which the change occurred inside of. Here you can see our petitioned area highlighted in blue. The neighborhood boundary encompass, encompasses Liberty Exchange, and then we travel west on Liberty Road to the Cleese Mill Road and Liberty Road intersection down to that commercial area. And then we loop back around to the petitioned area all along Liberty Road. And this boundary was agreed upon by Department of Planning staff as well as the applicant. So as said in the beginning, the petitioned area is all zone C2. You can see we have some conservation in the area, R20,000, R40,000, and then some I1 industrial light in the surrounding area. Part of our process is to send out the transmittal for agency comments. We have the agencies that we sent the transmittal to listed here. We sent this transmittal to the Reservoir Technical Group, who is a part of the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, because this area is um, located inside the Liberty Reservoir. We received one advisory comment from the Carroll County Health Department. They advised that the proposed use may not be acceptable unless it is demonstrated that there is an adequate water supply and adequate area for the installation of an initial and two replacement septic systems for the proposed use and any existing uses of this property. And they noted that it is only for parcel 703, which is this parcel second from the left. Why is that? I am not sure why it is only that parcel. I mean, isn't that? Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Um, we're not quite clear on that comment either as far as what it pertains to. However, and the reason we didn't even seek clarification is that these series of properties were part of the water and sewer amendment in right. the fall. So they um, were adopted by this body here and have been sent to MDE for their approval. Right. So that will not be um, an issue. Um, if and when this should become uh, developed because it will be on water and sewer service. Okay. Because, yeah, that doubts. Yeah. We we'll just Frank. bring it forward to you as one of okay. the comments mm -hmm. received. <clears throat> okay. Moving forward, as stated in the beginning, the applicant is arguing a mistake in the current zoning. I'm only going to hit the highlights as the applicant will have their time to dive into details later on in the hearing. The petitioner alleges mistake in the current zoning of C2. The zoning authority could not anticipate that the four contiguous parcels would come under the control and ownership of a single entity and thus would present commercial development opportunities more appropriate for a C3 zoning district. The property was mistakenly viewed as not being eligible for immediate sewer service during the most recent comprehensive rezoning of the parcels. Individual rezonings in the area show that more intense commercial uses, such as a business park, have been recognized as appropriate in the area. The continuing development of the Liberty Exchange project, including the potential development of the pad sites directly across Liberty Road from the property, would, could, and likely entail a commercial development that would be compatible with C3 zoning. Unlike some other areas of C2 zoning along Liberty Road, the property backs up to agricultural zone land, which is a lower density slash mixed use type zone, which would be um, uh, compatible with C3 uses such as a business park. The I1 zoned property immediately to the east of the subject property suggests that a heavier zone than C2 would be appropriate. 
And lastly, the pr property is appropriate for a C3 zoning designation, which is the only zoning district in the county allowing for development of a business park. It backs up to agriculture or conservation? I thought it was conservation. Conservation. Yeah, conservation zone land, but it's an yeah. agricultural usage. Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's yeah. agricultural yeah. usage, but it's conservation zoned. zoned. Correct. Okay, what, I'm not sure what you had on that slide that we just saw. I apologize. This is the petitioner's arguments taken from their petition that they submitted to us. Agricultural, yeah, but see, you have backs up to agriculturally zoned land, and that's not true. Okay. It's yeah, we, we copy it directly. We don't want to change yeah, the Yeah, that wasn't. From I, I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's conservation zone. Correct. Agriculturally Correct. used. Got it. Okay. So those were the applicant arguments of mistake, and the staff draws the uh, conclusions. Staff believe there was no mistake in the last comprehensive rezoning in applying the C2 designation. At the time of the last comprehensive rezoning, three of the four parcels in the petitioned area were requested by the then property owner to rezone from R20,000 residential to C2. This was part of the by request phase of the comprehensive rezoning process that was adopted in 2021. Following in-depth research of the rezoning request, a staff report was pr prepared by planning, presented to both planning commission and the county commissioners, and the rezoning was ultimately adopted by the Board of County Commissioners, rezoning the properties to C2. The fourth parcel was rezoned from R20,000 to Business General BG following the comprehensive rezoning process in the early 2000s. Similar to the 2020-2021 by request process, the then property owner applied for a rezoning. A staff report was prepared by planning, presented to both planning commission and the county commissioners, and the zoning was ultimately changed from R20 to BG. And then following the elimination of the BG districts, that fourth parcel was placed into the C2 zoning district. So let me just, a little bit of history yeah. again. Um, as we went through the process 2021, mm -hmm. we moved it from R20,000, those four parcels. These three parcels were originally three, zoned R20. To C2. Correct. We did that by a request or was Correct. it done? The, prop, done? the then property owner, different than the one today, applied for, those, um, for that rezoning. And there's no C3 property in this community at this time correct and then a little bit later on before that and be, before the two, that, yeah you're right we moved that residential to c2 mm -hmm. correct to business BG, general bg yeah to business general yeah okay yes and, okay. and where would the closest c3 zoned <laughs> property be to this uh, location um, here i'm going to put you on the spot because uh, i don't think your map's that big but to, to the <laughs> east <laughs> Um, yeah, tour 32 intersection. It's not okay. there. It's way down by mm -hmm. 2632 yeah. intersection. Probably and, off and of for and you know, I'm guilty of not bringing my awesome uh, <laughs> handout <laughs> with you. me. Uh, Thank but you, uh, if you had to characterize the difference between C2 and C3, it sounds like it's a. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a difference, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I mean, I'm reading through the slides. It's it's a level of intensity. I mean, can you explain Correct. a little bit about what people watching might yes be able to glean from that? And so let me just clarify too. So there's no other C2 zone, I mean C3 zoned property mm -hmm. in this area. However, the land use designation of the industrial piece across, which is now, which is the Liberty Exchange property, does have a land use designation in the Freedom Plan as commercial high. Just during the by request phase, the decision by the property owner was to not rezone their property. They wanted to stay in the I1 um, district. So just to so so it's kind of like totally not out of character to have this more intense of a use out here. Um, so Hannah, can you just give them a briefing of what the difference between C two and C three is from the yeah definitions? And then also, the Liberty Exchange it's one of a kind. Yes, it correct. It's one of a kind in the county. That correct. You know so and that that's also important to to understand that it's not you know. Um, we're doing this model in other places. This is one of a kind model, so it does, in that sense, conform uh, to the rest of it. But there's still the question: of where else is C3? So, but go ahead. 
So um, in your booklet, the definition of the C2 medium intensity district, a diverse range of medium intensity retail, service and professional office uses needed by a larger population than those provided for in the C1 district. Um, bic bicycle and pedestrian access are encouraged where possible. And then for C3, high intensity, large scale retail businesses and destinations of a regional nature, planned business parks, clusters of commercial development, wholesale businesses, offices, and certain light processing operations. And it's also the intensity of the square footages mm -hmm. allowed of the various um, building types. So I think a, a C2 goes up to 60,000 square feet and then C3 can go beyond that. So I'm going to keep on going. Um, okay. The petitioned area was given a land use designation of commercial medium in the 2018 Freedom Community Comprehensive Plan, making its current C2 zoning consistent with that land use designation. So looking at all of this, the designation of the petitioned area as C2 was deliberate as each specific parcel was specifically looked at for its current zoning of C2. No, that was just for the mistake argument. Correct. Just wanted to make that clear. Yes. Going back to the um, C2 and C3 um, differences, there's differences in the uses mm -hmm. of permitted and conditional uses. There's no differences in the, um, the height restrictions and all of that stuff. That's correct. The same, yes. whether it's C two or C three, it, ha it it's you know fifty feet max height, mm -hmm. fifteen feet you know side yard, 50, ten and then ten front. I mean that's in C two and C three, correct? Yeah. I believe so. Uh, it, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm if you're reading it, then yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm reading. From my mind, I can't. I, that's okay. I I'm, say I'm yes. reading it's what you wrote. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's it's really focused on the use and the intensity and correct. the intensity but not on the, the property's dimensions. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that is the mistake argument. Um, staff does not believe there was a mistake in the designations of C2. Moving on to the change arguments presented by the applicant. There have been substantial changes in the character of the neighborhood related to road improvements, surrounding rezonings, changes to the water and sewer service areas, and development of the surrounding area. Changing the public sewer service status of a property is a substantial change in the character of the property, rendering it a different animal in the neighborhood with real potential to affect and influence the neighborhood in a fundamentally different way than a septic well property would. Zoning text amendments allowed for the hybrid retail slash industrial uses, um, changing the character of the neighborhood by creating a tenant mix virtually next door to the property that would be more compatible with C3 zoning. And again, this is from the applicant. This right. is what they're right. proposing. Okay. Correct. So staff conclusions of the change argument. Staff believe there has been a change in the character of the neighborhood. Um, as we discussed earlier, the petitioned area applied for and is currently going through a water and sewer fall amendment. The property is currently in the existing and priority service category for water and the long range service category for sewer. The purpose of this amendment is to bring the entire petitioned area, which is approximately 12 acres, into the priority service category for both water and sewer. Bringing the petitioned area into these service categories will increase the allowable water and sewer allocation for a possible development. This amendment was adopted by the Board of County Commissioners and forwarded to the Maryland Department of the Environment for the official approval at their January 26, 2023 open session. As stated in the petitioner's arguments of change, Maryland case law specifically notes that changes in the public water and sewer infrastructure can constitute as a substantive change. Um, at the time when the C2 zoning district was designated to the petitioned area in 2021, county staff were unaware the petitioned area would come under the control and ownership of a single entity, ultimately increasing the acreage of the parcels. Some of the major differentiating factors and uses allowed in the C2 and C3 district are intensity and necessary acreage. 
The C3 zoning district allows for more intense uses, but those uses also tend to require a larger acreage. Now that the petitioned area has increased in acreage due to ownership, it may be more suitable for those three C3 uses. So that's it for the details of the rezoning case. As we get closer to um, you all making your decision, the annotated code of Maryland states the legislative body shall make findings of fact that address population change, the availability of public facilities, present and future transportation patterns, compatibility with existing and proposed development for the area, the recommendation of the Planning Commission, and the relationship of the proposed amendment to the local jurisdiction's plan. At the January 17th Planning Commission meeting, they gave this rezoning a favorable recommendation to you all. This was introduced and requested to go to public hearing at your January 26th open session. Today we are here for a public hearing. And then if no um, decision is reached today, we have time scheduled next Thursday, February 23rd, for a final decision from you all. And as of today, we have not had any um, comments come in from the public mm -hmm. submitted. Um, so not that there's not public here or on the phone, but no one has submitted anything. The um, uh, Planning Commission <clears throat> favorable was it a heated discussion was it a it was a unanimous yeah. decision by them unanimous. Mm -hmm. they felt that the water and sewer amendment um, constituted a change in their opinion yeah um, okay I'm trying to think if there's any other questions um, back back yeah, to uh, which which we've talked about on other cases to use and ownership this is four parcels. Correct. We can talk about the zoning. The four parcels will remain four parcels and could ultimately be individually owned later? So we're going to have the applicant address some of that in their okay. report, what their intent is. Um, but again, when you make your decision, contemplate it for all C3 uses. I know it's always interesting to hear from what an applicant is proposing to do, but it's not until the site plan is approved and construction happens that that use will come to fruition. And, okay. and the applicant right. owns all four parcels at this time. Correct. Correct. That is our understanding, yes. Um, so that gives it another dynamic. So, um, okay. Um, are there any other questions for our staff at this time? Not at this moment for me. Can okay. I ask one question? Do, do the commissioners have the planning uh, staff report? They it was sent to them prior to their introduction okay, in January. You. Let's make that a part of the record for today's if, yeah. hearing. If you can. Thanks. Um, okay. And just to clarify, when was it, when did it go from R20 to C2 again? What was the date that that was approved? It was adopted in early 2021, Commissioner right. Rothstein and yeah. Yeah, the previous board. Right. We, uh, the previous board. Correct, yeah. Correct. We went through properties specifically on um, south of Liberty Road mm -hmm. that we moved from residential to C2. Those by um, Princess Shopping Center all the way down to this, I remember. Mm -hmm. So, I believe it was approved in December and then went into effect in January of 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was just to uh, conform the south part of Liberty Road into a... Uh, into more of a commercial district so okay any other questions from the commissioners okay um, commissioner staff uh, uh, the applicant is here represented at seat at the table sit down staff do you have any questions of uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, do you sorry. have any questions of staff after you identify yourself for the board thank you good morning commissioners kelly schaefer miller 73 east main street westminster maryland 21157 i'm here today on behalf of eldersburg investors l2 llc um, commissioner rothstein actually asked the only question that i did have of staff already so i do not have any thank you okay so what was that question yeah. just curious <laughs> it was just to confirm that the planning commission discussion and yeah. and favorable okay. recommendation okay. was unanimous thank Thanks. you Okay. okay, so you guys can take I'm, a back I'm, seat. Yes, thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. I am going to call my first witness, Mr. Thomas Pilon. I also prepared, and I want to make sure that I project into the microphone, packets of all of our exhibits for you. And I will point out a few of them once I hand them out because Mr. Burke just asked about a few. So, 
Thank you. While you're doing that, would anybody who's going to testify uh, please stand and swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is uh, is true? Okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love one if you have one. I wish the other Mr. Schaefer or Schaefer had this so organized, but thank you. <laughs> just, just saying. I mean, it was, uh, you know, one thing after another. Didn't know where it was coming from, but this is very succinct. I after last week, we said the first. I'm just saying. <laughs> Once again, there's noise coming from the back. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Oh, thank you. I also have an, have an extra copy that I'm going to set right here in this chair in case anyone to look through there. So just briefly before I officially call Mr. Pilon, I want to point out that the first entry in there is a legal mem memorandum, which is just a very brief synopsis of some of the case law that supports the arguments that are going to be made here today. The second exhibit is a timeline that also points out some of the dates that were just asked about, so hopefully that will be helpful to just have in front of you. The third exhibit is, the, is also a copy of the county staff report, so in case you didn't already have a copy printed in front of you, there's one included in this packet as well. So, and then the fourth exhibit um, is a copy of the staff report that was part of that by request. Mm -hmm. uh, comprehensive rezoning effort that staff just spoke to in the introduction. So I've included packet or copies of each of those just for convenient reference throughout and would ask that those be entered as the first four exhibits and then we'll talk through the rest as we uh, continue our presentation. So moved. Thank you. Mr. Pilon, can you please state your name, spelling your last name and address for the record please? Thomas Pilon. P I L O N 2560 Lord Baltimore Drive, Windsor Mill, Maryland, 20 or 21244. <laughs> and Mr. Pilon, can you please tell the board where you are employed? St. John Properties. And can you explain your role and experience at St. John Properties? <clears throat> sure. I am the Executive Vice President of Development. Um, my department is responsible for shepherding our projects through the uh, some people would call the entitlement process or however you want to refer to it, basically uh, from due diligence until we have permits in hand and then we hand it off to our construction group. And can you tell us uh, just a little bit about St. John Properties in general? Sure. Um, so St. John Properties was founded in 1971 by Edward St. John, who is still the uh, uh, chairman of the board and uh, executive of the main executive of the company. Um, we're located in I mentioned Windsor Mill near Baltimore. Uh, we have been for the last 50 years uh, developing uh, business parks in and around the greater Baltimore metropolitan area as well as a number of other areas throughout the state as well as uh, in several other states, Wisconsin, Colorado, Utah, Texas, North Carolina, uh, maybe some others. Um, and uh, we own and operate about 23 million square feet of uh, commercial uh, office industrial space that we uh, uh, lease to uh, businesses and such. Um, we're a long-term uh, real estate investment company. We're privately held, but uh, over the uh, last 26 years that I've been with St. John Properties, our portfolio has increased from about 6 million square feet to about tw to the 23 million that we're at today. Um, so, And we don't tend to sell stuff. We develop only for ourselves. Um, and work general contractors and such as well. Um, so we're just building a portfolio. Is it a fair summary to say that St. John Properties is what we would call a buy and hold type of developer? Yes. Yep. Okay. And can you briefly describe how you became familiar with opportunities in Carroll County? Uh, so we have an acquisitions group. I mentioned that we do our work from due diligence through the permitting phase. Um, we have a a group of individuals who are out looking for opportunities to invest. Um, so as they're doing that throughout the state, um, we've been, you know, keeping an eye on Carroll County and kind of looking for opportunities. Now, the application in front of this board is in the name of Eldersburg Investors II LLC. Uh, what entity would develop this property? So St. John Properties would act as the development entity on behalf of, uh, of the uh, LLC. 
and it's accurate that the LLC owns all took ownership of all four of these parcels. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Can you was it on July 26th, 2022 that Eldersburg Investors 2 acquired all four parcels by deed? Is that the correct date? Yes, that's the right okay. date. Yes. Now I'm going to show you what I've marked and I've tried to mark these as the exhibit numbers in the left hand column but then I've tried to paginate also because there's a lot of pages here. So I'm going to turn to uh, what I've marked as petitioners exhibit five which begins on page 32 of the actual packet and the page numbers are kind of in the upper right hand corner for you. So. Mr. Pilon, briefly, you don't, I mean, you have seen these before, so I won't ask you to review them, but is it accurate that applicants exhibit five represents the deeds to each of these parcels? Yes. Okay, and, and that those indicate that Eldersburg Investors to LLC took ownership on the 26th of July, 2022, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it correct that three of the parcels currently have residences uh, improved on them? Yes. And are those currently occupied? No, they're not. Can you tell us what the status is of those residences? So they are uh, currently just secured and, and vacant. Um, as recently as yesterday, we inspected the properties um, just to be sure that there's nothing going on, you know, that nothing's in disorder and such. But yeah, they're currently vacant and secured. I would like to ask that petitioners exhibit five be entered, please. Yep, got it. Thank you. Mr. Pilon, has St. John Properties developed any other sites in Carroll County? Yes. Okay. And is that known as Liberty Exchange? Yes. Okay. Where is Liberty Exchange located? Uh, just to the north, on the north side of Liberty Road, kind of opposite this property. So on that neighborhood map, just so that everybody has the context, the neighborhood map that's part of um, the staff report, is that shown on there? Yes. Okay. And that's the large swath of, of purple, which is industrial, correct? It, uh, it's half of it. Okay. One half is the um, tobacco, I forget right. the name of the tobacco flavoring company, and then the, the western half is Liberty Exchange. Okay, thank you. Would you consider Liberty Exchange a successful project in Carroll County? Yes. Okay. Is Liberty Exchange, um, a good example of the type of development, generally speaking, that St. John Properties does? Yes. Describe a little bit the, the tenant mix for these type of parks, how they're selected, and how we come up with you know, a Liberty Exchange type product. Um, so Liberty Exchange is comprised of a few different building types. As you move from the front of the property to the back of the property, we have kind of traditional retail buildings at the front, and then we have one-story office buildings and then the back are what we call flex buildings uh, which are suitable for different types of uses all of those buildings lend themselves to being multi-tenanted um, which means that you can have multiple principal uses in the in the buildings themselves um, so the retail buildings you know we're typically looking for retail type uses um, inside of our parks we're always looking for uh, a lot of convenience type uses our tenants <laughs> excuse me would typically be looking for they kind of ask us two questions, where can I park and where can I eat? Um, excuse me. <clears throat> they, um, uh, so that's kind of what's at the front of the property. And then we've got, there were some medical uses and things like that in the office buildings. Um, they, those buildings tend to lend themselves to that type of a tenant. Um, and then the back buildings can be a, a mix of types of uses. As an example, uh, the, the brewery was, is back in the one building. Um, we have an outdoor, uh, supply for like patio furniture and things like that in one of the buildings um, so the tenants in working with the brokerage community we have in-house leasing agents and they're responsible by kind of areas so we have someone who's designated to this area um, and they work with the brokerage community to um, bring tenants to our parks and we go through and we look at them and qualify them as you know good tenants meaning basically that they can pay the bills um, they have a successful a good looking business plan and they can pay the bill and then we lease them to them. Is that good? Okay. I think that was a, that was an, a good summation. Um, if this petition were successful, is it the intent uh, of St. John Properties to develop these four parcels as a business park? Yes. Okay. 
can you explain now recognizing that a business park is a different section of the code than what Saint, what Liberty Exchange has developed under can you explain why St. John Properties finds the business park model appealing sure um, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the different types of buildings that we have business park allows for those uses so we could do some retail uses in there we can have office uses and we can have flex buildings uh, and uh, and in fact we're intending to do a mix like that uh, with this park so it would be similar even though it's different it would be similar to what we the success that we've had over at uh, Liberty Exchange and I'm sorry you said flex buildings flex yes. okay thank you yeah but it's a building type it's kind of like a retail building uh, if you'd like a little explanation if not I just Sure, please, yeah, please, sure. Yeah. Please. A, a flex building is somewhat like an inline retail building, meaning that you it's designed with the intent of allowing. Uh, you could have you could have a, a law firm in there. You could have a doctor's office in there. You could have a, you know, some type of light manufacturing. We have the brewery in one of the buildings. Um, so the front of them is like a one-story office building. You walk up, you have your own private entrance. We don't have what's called common areas in the building. So when you lease a bay or multiple bays of that building, you have your own entrance and you kind of control your own environment. Um, and then the back of the building has a loading component to it so that you can, if you have trucks that need to come and go and things like that. Um, and through our portfolio, we have a, a wide range of uses that land in these business parks and in the, in the flex buildings. Uh, but it's, a lot of people confuse it with a use as opposed to a building type. You have retail buildings, you have office buildings, you have medical office buildings and your flex buildings are some of the types so and, and piggybacking that question sure. the um the, the flex buildings typically are built prior to having tenants so you can be flexible but the other buildings there will you build them for tenants or some will also be um you know you don't know who's going to be in it yet but sure. you're building it so we st john has our whole business model is we're speculative builders meaning that we build in advance we look at a market we make a determination as to whether or not we think that market is in need um, and then we build there um, and then we actually carry that through so like we'll build a building when that building's 50 percent leased we'll build the next building so that we always have availability until we've finished out a project and it's and it's stable um, uh, Kelly asked earlier if that you know if we considered Liberty Exchange a successful business park and the answer is yes it's it's a stable park we're getting market rents uh, you know we got a good mix of tenants in there and things like that so yes we we built speculatively the difference at Liberty Exchange the very front of that where it's currently there's nothing up there um, those are pad sites and pad sites we would typically be looking to lease that piece of land to somebody who would build their own building or we might build for them so yeah Thank you for those questions. You, 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 he, he's already answered some of my questions. Yeah, so that's a good thing. So, no, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We, we moved, uh, we moved efficiently. I like it. Absolutely. So, Mr. Pilon, you understand that that this petition, um, if approved, would result in C3 zoning, which is, you know, subject to the conditions. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. And although you've in, uh, testified that the intent would be to develop a business park on the site, you understand that any C3 use would be could be developed on the site, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. One quick follow-up to uh, uh, my entity question about Eldersburg Investors 2. Can you confirm that Ed St. John is a principal in Eldersburg Investors 2 LLC? He's a, he's a member. Member, yes, okay. I, I think right. member is right. the yes. correct legal term for an LLC so yes in, you know, I, got I know you have to be 100% <laughs> accurate yes no I appreciate that and then circling back um, to some of the discussions about the flex buildings can you also uh, confirm that the st. John properties model usually is a brick and glass type of structure usually always always yes. okay <laughs> there you go see even more accurate okay those were my Last questions and concludes my testimony of Mr. Pilon. Are there any questions for Mr. Pilon? Um, <clears throat> first question I, I do have is, first off, are you the senior St. John representative here this, yes. uh, this morning? By, do you mean by age this or afternoon. by title? <laughs> <laughs> yes to both. <laughs> okay. So I want to make uh, a couple comments pretty clear. Um, 
because uh, social media can get away from people sure. and it's, it's garbage in so many cases, um, especially when people write anonymously, which is even more garbage. But uh, I have no intent of recusing myself in any decision we make because I believe I can be very unbiased as I've shown over the last five years. It actually questions my ethics over 30 years in uniform, so um, I will stay unbiased. And the reason I'm bringing this up now, because you are senior, because we've known each other for four years, mm -hmm. and I've watched um, Liberty Exchange uh, continue to succeed. And, um, you know, speaking to, and I know he's back there somewhere, Mr. Lyburn, on Liberty Exchange, and also to Mr. Tweel, who's now Howard County Economic mm -hmm. Developer, on his success. Sure. Um, and they were my counterparts when I was the economic developer in Anne Arundel County, which I think is still probably the largest county that St. John has property. Um, maybe Baltimore and Anne Arundel. Maybe, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, yes. I mean, just phenomenal. And the success we had with a developer like St. John's, mm -hmm. um, along with Merritt and others, but St. John specifically in Anne Arundel was second to none. Um, and, uh, you know, no favoritism, no, you know, doing things inappropriately. Everything was very transparent with the county executive at that time. Um, led to a lot of success. Um, St. John is a contributor to me, but I don't think it's St. John Properties. I think it's from a St. John entity. Could have been one of the answers. So, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, um, just as I get donations or whatever con contributions from others um, which doesn't bother me and probably all the large developers in the state because of my work from Anne Arundel County uh, and I'm just bringing this up very clear now because again you're you're the senior um, that you believe I can be unbiased in my effort and I think our conversations have been very unbiased not always going your way or St. John's way um, right. And it's been very clear. Uh, so, yeah, just uh, I want my colleagues to rest assured. I want everybody in the community to rest assured. And all those, whether we call them snakes or whatever on social media that don't want to identify themselves, rest assured uh, that I'm very comfortable in a very unbiased uh, leadership role that I have on the dais. So, um, I do believe St. John's uh, does a good product, you know, Thank and that's you. what. Uh, Appreciate that. You know, in um, Liberty Exchange and in Arundel County. I mean, and we've talked about that. So, um, you mentioned Anne Arundel County. I think we're the second largest taxpayer in Anne Arundel County. I've been with Ed since 1997 at St. John, and uh, it, it, almost every business park in Anne Arundel County now that we've developed has got my name on it as development manager. Um, so it's been a place where we've been able to do a lot of investing. It's been really good. And a lot of revenue coming county. back to the county. So yeah, well, we try, you know. And and as mentioned before, you know, we're long-term investors. And once we get involved in a community, we, you know, we're involved in the community. Right. We, we're not fee developers. We don't turn and burn. So yeah. yep. Um. Yeah, I think uh, I just want to make more of that statement than the questions, but wanted That's to get the sure. verification from you, knowing you're the senior here. Sure. Yep. Um. So, okay. Are there any questions or comments? Just so I have a very, very basic sense of what we're looking at here so far. So the petitioner is saying that there was a mistake in the zoning and there was also a substantial change in the neighborhood. Are, am I, do I have that right so far? Okay. Yes, that's correct. Then our, our own department is alleging that there was not a mistake in zoning, but there was a substantial change in the neighborhood. Am I, I've got that so far? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, no, no more questions for me at this particular moment. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I, I'd, I'd like to add a comment. I, I mean, regardless of the source, I think residents of the county, when they have questions, they should ask them. I think if, if people uh, want to ask those type of questions, uh, I think they have every right to do so, and they, they do deserve an answer. And unfortunately, what, what type of questions? Unfortunately, if, if people, if people want to ask if I mean, I'm not really sure exactly exactly everything you're referring to, but if people have questions about their county commissioners and they want to ensure that they're taking an unbiased approach to all the decisions we make up here, 
I think it's in with completely within the county residents' right to ask that question. How they do it and where they do it, that's always a debate. But we're not above reproach. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're not uh, above that's reproach. That's the point I'm making. Absolutely. Right now. I agree. Hundred percent. And and unfortunately we, we are in a situation in the county where and this is not this is just the nature of things, county residents are concerned about development. It's not nineteen eighty three anymore. It's twenty twenty three. And people in this county have lived through enough development, enough traffic studies, enough plan studies to know that they need to pay attention to what's going on. I think that's what you're seeing. Yeah, I think uh, nobody's above reproach, and or reproach, whatever that word is. Um, how it gets to us is a different story, and um, I'm making it very clear that I'm unbiased. I'm making it very clear I hold my ethics in the highest regard to anybody that questions it. and whether I receive contributions from St. John's or anyone else. Um, people can ask me the question anytime they want. Uh, I've made that very clear to everyone. Um, how they do it, you know, unfortunately, social media has gone away from us and it becomes very circular and it's uh, in many cases very embarrassing um, that we can't get through to the truth of the matter. And that's my point that I'm making. So, well, okay. I could very briefly say I've certainly respect the questions have been asked, Commissioner. I respect the fact that you've addressed those questions. Um, and if I could go back to the the question, so why? Remind me, why is there an alleged mistake in the zoning? What was the what's the source of that? The allegation that there was a mistake in the zoning. Made. The two principal allegations, and and the reason, Commissioner Vigliotti, that I think. Uh, led you to ask that initial question which is okay are we claiming change and mistake or one or the other is because the um the two principal allegations kind of fit under both arguments and that's why i put together that legal memo for you all too because that summarizes some of the case law in regards to a mistake um and and the fact that a mistake is not a disregard for information on the part of staff a mistake under maryland case law can sometimes be facts that were not part of a consideration because they weren't available at that time so to get to your question the two principal uh statements allegations however you want to phrase them are that there was a change to the sewer service area okay these properties if you see on that that timeline these parcels went from long range service to priority service and the second change being that these properties went from individual ownership to common ownership which significantly changes uh, the development potential and use potential for you say that one more time it went from what to common it went from individual ownership of the four parcels to common ownership of the four. Eldersburg Investors 2 LLC now owns all four of those parcels. And then based on the fact that there is now a common owner, you're saying that because the conditions of the ownership have changed, that constitutes the mistake that is being alleged? It's, it's one of the basis for the mistake, yes, because at the time that zoning implemented uh, the, the most recent comprehensive rezoning of that property, those were individually owned. Nobody knew that those were going to come under common ownership. So that has only been as of July of this past year that that occurred. And thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Point of will this now be made one parcel or will it remain four individual parcels? Can Commissioner, you can. Do you want me to start, or do you want to just I can, jump I can in? Answer. Okay. Um, so, the what will happen is we'll reconfigure the parcels um, so that we have whether they become legally called lots or exactly what the right term will be, but we'll reconfigure the shape of the boundary lines so that each building sits on its own lot, and we do that for financing purposes. Um, if you have it all on a single parcel, when you go to finance it, if you haven't built everything messes up how you they'll basically they'll escrow the money and then you're forced to build uh, and there's just yeah. a lot of junk goes on so yes we'll reconfigure it to probably three lots be my guess a point of clarification not f uh, for you but for you as far as what you share with us those l deeds one of those properties was owned by miss kirkner correct or kirshner 
who no. was on. No, she did not. She was not an owner. No. I saw a name. I, saw I think name. she witnessed one of those. Oh. I think she may have she been was, a real okay. estate agent. Okay, I just saw. I saw a name. I she saw was involved. Name. Yeah. She was the realtor. That yeah. okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. She was the agent. Okay. Yes. Okay. That that's good. I just yep. briefly saw it and I saw the name. So. And, and she, she did disclose that at the planning yeah, commission right. review as yep. well. Yes. Good. She has no involvement at this. So point. just yep. clarification, Ms. Kirshner is on our planning and zoning uh, commission, and she did disclose that that she was the agent. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank well, you, Commissioner. If there are no further questions of Mr. Pilon, I would call my next witness. Please. Okay. Mr. Andrew Stein. I call him Andy, so so don't uh, don't hold that against me if if I if I slip. Andy, can you please state your name, spelling your last name, and address for the record, please? Uh, Andrew Stein, S T I N E, one ninety two East Main Street, Westminster. And Andy, where do you work? I work for Development Design Consultants. Uh, Often we we trade as DDC Inc. And can you just briefly describe to this board your educational background? I have a master's degree in landscape architecture with a planning focus and a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture um, and also I've been uh, practicing a license in the state for the last uh, 22 years now I believe so you're a licensed landscape architect in the state of Maryland correct I am and I was wrong I, I've been practicing in the state for 22 but licensed for 20 at this point okay. and approximately how long have you worked in Carroll County uh, my entire career, uh, one of my first projects in Carroll County was working on the land acquisition for the Manchester Bypass. And during your time in working for the with the county, um, are you familiar with the county's policies and the county code? Yes. Have you qualified as an expert in front of boards and agencies in Carroll County, Maryland? Uh, yes, both the BZA and the Planning Commission and uh, various boards in all the uh, incorporated municipalities. I would like to offer Mr. Stein as an expert in the area of site development and planning. Please. Thank you. Mr. Stein, is it accurate that you prepared the plat that accompanied this petition? Yes, I worked with our surveyors in our office. Uh, those exhibits are typically su uh, sealed by surveyors, but I worked directly with them in preparation of the, the rezoning plats. Can you generally describe to us what goes into the preparation of that plat, what's looked at in preparing that plat? Uh, all the boundaries are field surveyed. So there's a field survey conducted. We look at tax records. We look at zoning information. We look at water and sewer category, uh, master plan information. Now, you've, you're familiar with the area um, that we are outlining as the neighborhood in this case, and that is part of the staff report, correct? Yes. Okay. Can you just describe, generally describe that area to us? Uh, as has been mentioned previously, uh, it's largely comprised of the Liberty Road corridor, um, with running from the uh, larger industrial properties uh, around Emerald Lane and Exchange Drive all the way west to the uh, intersection and all the commercial properties down by Cleese Mill Road. Now, I have marked in the packet here as Exhibit 6, and it's on page 65. Okay, so I'm going to show Mr. Stein that. And Mr. Stein, is this a copy of the county's official zoning map? That, yes, it is. And does that show the properties kind of in the uh, upper left corner there? Yes, it does. Okay. And can I know you just described kind of the uses in the neighborhood, but looking at this zoning map, can you describe the surrounding zoning specifically? Uh, yes, there is a, a mix of industrial and commercially zoned land to the north and east. Uh, immediately to the south is a conservation zone parcel, uh, and to the west um, there are residentially zoned properties along with those across the street. I would like to ask that Exhibit 6 be entered, please. So moved. Thank you. Now, Mr. Stein, in taking a look at, at this property and the surrounding properties, is it accurate that there is a conservation easement on the large uh, conservation zoned portion to the south of this site? Uh, yes, there was an easement uh, granted to the Maryland Environmental Trust uh, that I believe pertains largely 
to uh, the function of a buffer along Liberty Reservoir. So I'll refer to that. Um, that oh, is run, the I'm sorry. Maryland Forest Protection. I'm sorry, protection? I'm sorry that, Commissioner. Is that what you said Maryland Forest Protection? Uh, Maryland Environmental Trust. Maryland Environmental Trust, okay. Mr. Stein, as we talk through this, I'll, I'll have it in front of you. It is in the packet marked as Exhibit 7, and it begins on page 66 here. So. Mr. Stein, have you had the opportunity to review that easement document? I have. Okay, and I believe you just stated it, but can you just tell us again who the beneficiary of that easement is? Uh, it's the Maryland Environmental Trust. Okay. Is it an accurate summation that that easement document perpetually prohibits residential structures on the property uh, except for one additional structure at the northwest property corner? That is correct. It allows for a principal dwelling and accessory dwelling, and I believe it also mentions a possibility of having a recreational vehicle parked there. So if you generally were to kind of summarize the impact of this easement on that type of property, uh, would it be accurate to say that this really restricts any development potential on that southern portion? Yeah, unless something were to happen with that easement, there probably would never be a major residential subdivision to the south. Okay. I would like to ask that that Exhibit 7 be entered, please. So moved. Thank you. Mr. Stein, are you familiar with uh, the Liberty, what's known as the Liberty Exchange Project across the street? Uh, yes, I was involved with that property from practically the very start with St. John Properties. I was the project manager for the site component. There were a, a number of road improvements that our engineers worked on, but I oversaw the preparation and processing of the site development plan for Liberty Exchange. And I've been involved with that property for, I want to say, 14 years now, even up through assisting with the permits for tenants like 1623 Brewing. As part of that, but also any other projects you've been involved in, are you familiar with the site development plan process through Carroll County? Uh, yes, very familiar. Can you just g very generally describe the submittal and review process that, that would occur as part of any site plan? A pre-submittal meeting is scheduled with county staff, uh, usually followed by a concept site development plan review that also involves uh, conceptual stormwater management and sediment control. Uh, once the concerns regarding those items have been addressed uh, adequately, then a final site development plan is prepared and processed through the county. And that also has opportunity for planning commission, public review, and then uh, approval, correct? Yes. Okay. And is it is it accurate to say that if this rezoning petition were approved that any development that would occur on these properties would still be required to proceed through that process? Yes, the full process. Okay. Now, you're familiar with the zoning code and the uses that are allowed in C2 and C3. If a use is listed as a principal use in a district, does that inherently mean that it can happen on a site, that a site can be developed with it? It does not. Um, th there are numerous concerns, there are environmental factors, we have to look at traffic, we have to look at stormwater, we have to look at parking capacity. So just because a property possesses a certain, certain zoning designation, that does not predetermine what that property will be used for. Every single property is different and there's a lot of technical review that ultimately determines what can be built there. Okay. As a kind of super basic example, uh, would it be fair to say that, for example, a 60,000 square foot retail use would never develop even if it were C3 zoned on a one acre parcel? Yeah, in entirely possible that that would not happen, okay. or impossible that it would happen. You said impossible, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, possible. Just making I, I sure you getting, say that into the microphone. get rid of possible not to impossible. Yes, okay. Now, given that these four parcels each have access rights to Liberty Road um, currently, would the common ownership allow for a more central access point here? Yes, it could allow for the establishment of access easements within the property that would allow vehicle uh, entry and exit from the various parcels to be concentrated at one point. Actually, I'm going to back myself up a second. I have marked as Exhibit 8 here. The very last page is an aerial photo. So I'm going to show that to Mr. Stein. This is an aerial photo pulled from the county's GIS map, correct? Andy? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you explain just briefly how, uh, how these individual par parcels currently access Liberty Road? 
uh, 371 and I believe it's 373 uh, Liberty Road access through a shared driveway on the western side of the property and 411 Liberty Road has its own driveway entrance but there also appears to be a intermittently used paved connection between 411 and the shared driveway on the western side. So currently there are multiple access points amongst these four parcels, correct? Onto yes. Liberty Road. Okay. Aside from Liberty Road, do these properties access any other public street? No, they do not. Okay. Are you generally familiar with the State Highway Administration's guidelines? Yes. If these four parcels remained under individual ownership, would they each be entitled to access Liberty Road? Yes, it, it is conceivable that they could petition for e to each have their own access. Have you done enough concept work on the subject property to believe that the principal access for this site would be located at the existing exchange drive signalized intersection? Yeah, that makes the most sense from a traffic standpoint is to take advantage of the existing traffic signal and the control and safety that provides. And we have the benefit of designing the site that way because of the common ownership, is that correct? That is correct. I would like to ask that this Exhibit 8 be entered, please. Good Thank you. Andy, does the water and sewer status of a property, service status of a property, materially affect its development potential? Yes, it absolutely does because there are rather stringent well and septic requirements that have to be met, including setbacks from things like paving and stormwater facilities. And the fact that these properties are slated to be provided or moved into the priority category um, removes a very large uh, development uh, impediment. Would you consider that a drastic impact to a property, whether it was had to develop well and um, well and septic versus public facilities? Yes, I would. Okay. And you just, I believe you just said it, but the sewer s service status of these properties has changed since the last rezoning or has been adopted, I guess, by this board. Yes, I think I, it's I, still I, pending MD approval, correct? I understand that, yes, it is in process. Okay. Have you had the opportunity um, in preparation through this process to review the staff report? I have. Okay. And that's exhibit three, just for everybody's reference. Okay. Um, do you agree with the staff report? I do concur with the staff's ultimate determination of uh, change in neighborhood, yes. Okay. And can you tell us whether, in your opinion, you believe C3 is an appropriate zoning district for this property yeah. and uh, why? Either way. Given the, the size of the properties once assembled, the location on uh, a major roadway like Liberty Road in proximity to an established traffic signal and also the proximity to adjacent uses like Liberty Exchange and the industrial and commercial properties to the east, yes, I, I do believe it is fitting. I'm sorry, I'm just orienting myself. So you just said commercial properties to the east as well, correct? Yeah, yeah there's a small commercial property to the east. Okay. Uh, commercial, they're industrially zoned, but there are a number of commercial uses, uses in there. Okay, are you familiar with what the use is to the west of these parcels? Yes, although the property is zoned residential, it's actually a, it's a church, so it's an institutional use um, on the immediate west of the property. Mm -hmm. okay. So in your opinion, is the C3 zoning of these properties compatible with the surrounding zones? Yes, I believe so. And in your opinion, I know you just said you agreed with the staff report, but in your opinion, has there been a substantial change in the character of the neighborhood? Yes, I, I believe there has been, uh, considering the, the build out of Liberty Exchange and the consolidation of the properties under a single ownership and the water and sewer change, yes. Okay. Those are my only questions of Mr. Stein. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Additional questions? Uh, I have uh, I have two, and if you can't answer the one, you know, off the bat, that's all right. Um, I was just kind of curious if, if we know of any other areas, you know, offhand that are C3 that also are adjacent to residential and conservation areas. Absolutely, the 27 corridor coming out of Westminster to the north, out of Westminster to the south. This happened. There are uh, high commercial zones and industrial zones throughout the Finksburg area that are directly adjacent to conservation zones. Um, okay, and my, uh, so my second question then for you specifically, 
Uh, you mentioned a little while ago about uh, you know trying to adapt the nature of the business to the surrounding area. That is to say that you will take into account what surrounds. And I heard you speak about, I uh, mentioned specifically conservation, but what about the, the residential properties? I, I don't believe I understand the question. Take take them into account, or well, you, you had mentioned a little while ago that that you know the the kind of, of business or construction that will occur there is going to be reflective of what is surrounding the the area that you're going to build out. And you had specifically talked about conservation being one aspect of how you might build something, like you, in, with respect to that. So um, you know the fact that there are homes that are located adjacent to this. Are they going to factor into what you decide to do and how you decide to do it? Yeah, I, I believe they would. Uh, when we developed Liberty Exchange, that property at that time was actually split zoned and the back half of the property was conservation. But I, I believe that the development and Liberty Exchange is a very good example to look at. I believe that has been uh, very well integrated into the community and I think it would be possible having done that before that we could do it again. Thank you. Any other questions? So um, Liberty Exchange, though, has a tree line behind it. It does. And um, pretty much surrounded by a tree line from the neighbors, from the housing. Right. Whereas this doesn't, correct? It does not, but there, there are trees in places where it's possible to save them. We would save them, but also the county does have a, a landscape manual and the requirements to buffer between right. new uses and adjacent properties are in the case of something like this pretty robust and they would be complied with okay um yeah it's just when you you know talk about liberty exchange i mean you got to call mm -hmm. you know call a spade a spade mm -hmm. you know like apples and as i'm picturing it i see this tree line with liberty exchange um i'd be interested uh and it's not for you or you but for our own team there's a really good question about c3 that that um, is next to conservation across the county or residential. You know, this, again, these ideas that we are overdeveloping and we're becoming other counties and Randall's counties, and I, I, and I recognize those concerns. Um, it'd be interesting to know if there's other corridors that are like this in the county. Um, does you know we're we're very focused on this but you know i want to that, that was a really good question um the uh i i, I do know the process when we want to develop on a piece of property and it's got to go through you know the trc and go through all the different you know uh you know uh, decision you know process um and it may get caught up, you know, whether it's traffic or something, but this is where subjectivity comes into play and the community gets very concerned that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And um, I, I'm known to say just because you can doesn't mean you should in many cases, but when there's a will, there's a way, especially when it comes to development and um, if it can't be this, it'll be that. So if we open up the, the spectrum of what C3 can provide and it can't do a specific project, it can turn into another project. Um, you know, we just had this conversation a week or so ago with uh, another piece of property. They want, the intent is to do this, but you open up that door, they can do that capability or they could do a whole lot more. Um, and that's really what we're, we're focused on is, um, and I'm very, um, you know, aware of and keen to the community's concern that, you know, uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should, but if there's a will, there's a way, and they don't want, mm -hmm. like I don't want, overdevelopment in an area that doesn't need that or doesn't meet that. Um, so, uh, but, but I do know the levels. I mean, I, I understand that. Um, that's what we're dealing with. I mean, and it's, and the community has a voice as they should. So, um, okay. What else? Any, any comments, questions? 
and this is our time, but okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Just briefly, commissioners, I, I do want to distinguish it from that case last week because this is a commercial use requested to go to another commercial use, so in right. many ways it's very different. And I, I, I think that if you look down that use chart and look at the differences and, and what changes here as a result mm -hmm. of C3, ignoring a business park potential, what you'll see per predominantly is that uses change from conditional to permitted and really not that it opens up right. a bunch of greater uses there's much less changes because of the c2 to c3 request here so i would just encourage you to to breeze through the use chart too if there are questions there and i'm happy to answer any Absolutely. Um, very fair thank you i would next like to call mr jack Lyburn. hiding in the back Good afternoon. And this is this is not this has nothing to do with whom, but he is a witness, but he wasn't here when you swore everybody in. Oh, thank you for thank you for pointing that out. So if you we stand up, Mr. Lyburn. Not that I don't believe everything he says, you know. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lyburn, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is true? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Mr. Lyburn, can you please state your name? And uh, your address for the record. Uh, John Lyburn, uh, 225 North Center Street, Westminster, 21157. And what is your current employment and position, please? Uh, the Director of Economic Development for Carroll County. Are you familiar with St. John Properties? Very much so. Okay. Have you been heavily involved since the inception of Liberty Exchange? Uh, yes. Okay. And are you familiar with the property that we're talking about here today? Very much so, yes. Can you tell us whether, in your opinion, C3 zoning on these parcels would further the county's goal of encouraging economic development? It's an it's it's easy answer, but a longer answer. Uh, Liberty Exchange has been one of the most successful projects we've had in Carroll County. And you're talking about, uh, you're talking about a premier developer who uh, we work with very closely and flexibility is is the is the really the question, and C three gives us more flexibility than than the C two. The the nice th thing, the greatest thing about working with at St. John or the St. John properties is they do build spec buildings. They build spec buildings, and when we when we see clients, we really don't have a lot of inventory, and they have the inventory. So C3 gives us the more flexibility that we would need, and I really believe this, you know, be a mirror image of, um, you know, the Liberty Exchange, and I think it's very beneficial for the, the county to have another project like that, another tool in our tool chest that we can take, uh, we can take projects to them, you know, with spec buildings. So yes, I do agree with should be C3. Thank that was you. a longer answer than a simple question. Oh, that well, I appreciate that uh, <clears throat> summation. Um, that was my only questions of okay. Mr. Lyburn. Any questions? Okay. You finally got him under oath. This was your chance. <laughs> <laughs> so many things we can, but we do want to move this along. So I'm always under oath. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that concludes my testimony in the case okay thank you are there any other questions for Ms. Schaefer okay do we have uh, public uh, comments uh, first off thank you so much um, Chris is there anyone on the line I have no one on the line okay thank you. Roberta how many public comments do we have two okay um, Elizabeth Russell you come to the microphone and state your name and address and make your comments Hello. Hi. I'm Elizabeth Russell. I live at 6016 Emerald Lane, which is the conservation area. OK. So I noticed 11 suits walk into this room at the precise time that we're going to talk about this. So they probably missed in regards to earlier when you mentioned the history of the courthouse and you placed value in the histories of our great county. In 2010, the census of Sykesville was 4,436, and in 2016, BudgetTravel.com named Sykesville the coolest small town in America. 
you mentioned that there's a mistake with the rezoning, but becoming more efficient, more efficient does not mean that we've created a mistake in our county and in Sykesville. W larger roadways actually reduce volume and traffic within the area, so there's less people in a certain amount of time. As regards to in the individu individual to common, aka you bought a lot of different areas to combine to one to create a massive structure. It's not appropriate in this um, area, backed up to a conservation area. This conservation area has horses that frequent the trails in that area. It's also known as Old Liberty Road. So we all have a historical component to that. There was a lot of information discussed in that 22 page packet that you guys had and I have chicken scratch. I'm a registered nurse at Johns Hopkins, so I don't have a suit. And when I'm not doing that, I wear combat boots in the United States Army. My husband's a law enforcement officer, and being that we live in that conservation area and backed up to this C3, you know, big component infrastructure, stresses me out. Right now, my kids, four and three, can go outside without the fear that they're gonna get run over by a car. I, I am afraid of the high traffic and high efficiency area that they're concerned and making. It will cause pollution and not just the pollution of smog from cars, but also light and noise pollution. Sometimes I have to sleep during the day. I can't have construction going on. And that's only gonna be the short term. Then I'm gonna have consistent car traffic I can go outside in my yard right now and see the stars, so many stars, but with a whole uh, Liberty, um, what was it called? A Liberty Exchange-like mm -hmm. facility, I'm gonna lose a lot of that. And you also talked about creating a larger interse intersection. So now there's gonna be a higher traffic congestion area at that site because you're adding more to it. So your zoning, how did I write this? You originally bought Liberty Exchange and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful structure. I use it, it's great, however, it's only, we made comments that there is no other C3 zoning. So if you continue to compare your new property to Liberty Exchange, why do you need to create that C3 property? I don't think the neighborhood support this at all. Conservation or just church or families. Thank you. A um, cu couple just comments. Um, thank you for your service. Um, and I'm very familiar with Emerald Lane. My daughter rides horses or used to ride horses all the time, uh, her, her, her horse on those trails. And um, so I'm very familiar. Um, you brought up very good solid points and I appreciate that. Um, are there any questions, comments? Ms. Schaefer, you have any? I do not, thank okay, you. Thank you so much. Chris Vaughn is the only other. Thank you for the, thank you for the, move this up a little bit. Thanks for the opportunity to make, uh, speak to y'all commissioners about this. And I'm not gonna speak nearly as eloquent as Ms. Russell. And I was very impressed by that. Um, I do find the argument with the C2 to C3 to be very, very much a bait and switch. The properties were bought as C2 properties. They knew it when they bought them. Now they want to rezone it to C3. Um, I am part of the neighborhood. I don't support the development of it. Um, ultimately, my property backs up to property, which backs up to it. And uh, I moved to Carroll County because I wanted a safe place to live with great schools. Carroll County is a beautiful place. Mr. Kyler said, it's great. 
He said that in the beginning, remembered that. And ultimately, I just don't see the value in it. We have seven vape shops, 11 liquor stores, I wanna say um, 18 gas stations and some other stuff. The county is growing, Eldersburg specifically is growing at less than 1% on an annual basis, about 0.69% since the 2020 census. I don't see that being a significant growth margin uh, to warrant such another complex like Liberty Exchange. What are we gonna get? Five below, some other garbage stores. Don't think it's necessary. I also am concerned with the uh, impact to the environment, even if there is sewer associated with it, uh, from light noise pollution, as Ms. Russell brought up, but also what about the other things that happen in addition to it? Um, if it was to go forward, is there an escrow account to account for the environmental impact of it? Because it does back up to conservation land, which does back up to Piney Run, which all impacts my water under the ground that I use. So I'm tremendously concerned with this development. All it takes is driving, you know, 15 minutes east, another county, another town. I'm not going to cite it, but I don't want to live there. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Absolutely, um, Mr. Vaughn. Thank you for the comments and understand. Um, when you're talking about vape shops, are you talking about in Eldersburg or in the county? Eldersburg. Okay. Um, I had no idea. I, yeah, I don't get vaping anyway, so it doesn't I, make I, sense. I agree with so. you. Um, I don't either. And yeah. I mean, that's a troubling indicator. And, yeah. you know, I think we can all agree yeah. more people creates more crime, more problems, more pollution. Agreed. The good thing is we're doing really well. And That's uh, correct. our sheriff's department and District 9 down in our area is very good. And I want to keep it that way, just yeah. as you do. So uh, more of a statement than questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments? May I add one more thing, sir? Um, I want Eldersburg like that emblem on the behind you. <laughs> That's what I want. I don't want a skyscraper. Okay. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Commissioner, I'm sorry. I just had one question. I apologize. Mr. Vaughn, why don't you please come back up? Absolutely. Mr. Vaughn, I'm, I apologize if I missed it, but could you please state your address? Okay. 5715 White Rock Road. Thank okay. you. Thank Six you. house down, teal mailbox. Can't miss it. Yep. Know it well. So Not I, at your house, but the road. <laughs> So, are, so are we able to ask a previous witness? I mean, I, I think that question was was pretty. Uh, I think it was a pretty salient question that the per the property was purchased knowingly as C two, and now the desire is to upgrade it to C three. And while I understand that there are arguments that are being made about whether or not there is a mistake in zoning, uh, the substantial change of the neighborhood, that sort of thing, what is the motive, the the underlying foundational motive to want to change it from C two to C three, other than simply that, oh, well, we think there was a mistake in the zoning or that there was a substantial change in the, the neighborhood. Mr. Figliotti, I'll, I'll take a shot at that one and I'll let somebody else chime in if they disagree with me. Um, I appreciate you recognizing the two legal arguments or the two principal legal arguments in terms of change or mistake. But right now, a business park, which again, I understand that we are here requesting C3, so there's no way for you to commit us to a business park. But the only district that a business park is allowed to develop in under the code is C3 district. And, and so I guess that, that begs, and I promise I'm not trying to be argumentative or disagreeable or anything, but I guess that, that begs the question that, that if, if this is what the developers originally sought, then why did they decide to go with the land that they went with to purchase? Well, I, I can't get into their head for that one, so I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to even try to answer that one. Um, but if Mr. You know, if Mr. Pilon wants to take a stab at it, I can recall him if you would. Uh, prefer me to but that one I can't I you just I, want to take it as a but as a business decision either way well I, I guess are it, are you comfortable with that being the answer that it's just a business decision that this is how you want to proceed it's up to you up, yeah I mean, I yes I, I would okay. call mr. Thomas peel on again Probably, I, sure I think you should introduce today. yourself at least again, again for the record. Uh, Thomas Pilon, St. John Properties, Executive Vice President of Development. Yep. Thank you. Um, so if I understood the question, the question was why did we buy it when it was C2 zoned um, and now proposing to rezone it to C3? 
Um, I think the simple answer is we, when we look, we, we knew what we wanted to do, at, I think as far as the development of the property. We liked what we did at Liberty Exchange. We thought we could um, mimic that over here. And you know we're in the business of doing development. It's not outside the um, kind of realm of normal business operations to say you're going to take a property and reposition it. Sometimes we do that where we acquire an existing property that's already developed, um, and it's not getting. I mentioned before market rents and things like that. Um, and you do something to reposition the property. You go in and you put investment in the, you know, uh, reface the building. Uh, redo the interior of the buildings and things like that. We took a building in Baltimore City several years ago that sits right on 95 and it 20% leased. And uh, and so out of a five-story building, one floor basically was occupied. And we got renovated the whole building, uh, made some changes to we tore out the existing windows and made larger windows and things like that. We modernized the building and it's now a stable building, which means it's got 90% occupancy in it. Um, so sometimes you, you purchase something and it's not quite positioned exactly right and you try to get it there and you know, do the type of development you'd like as, as investors that we'd like to do. So, yeah. I, mean, so I guess I could simplify that by saying it's a business decision, but yeah, right, and <laughs> strategy. I, I, I get yeah. that, and, but, but your intent coming in was that you were going, you wanted to develop it in this capacity despite the fact that it had the designation that it did. Yeah, I mean, we just saw the potential for it and yep. And how often does that typically happen that you say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, we see that, that, you know, the, the plot of land over here could really work well as a movie theater or whatever the case is. And this is, you know, even though it's not zoned for this, this is what we think it could be used for. And we're going to try to, to take a go at it. Right. Um, so as an example, in Baltimore County, Baltimore County does a comprehensive rezoning every four years. And in my years that I've been with St. John, it's my 26th year. Um, every four years, we're taking something that we already own and we're probably and we're repositioning some portion of the property. Uh, as an example, we have a series of properties that run along York Road uh, from the Beltway out to Hunt Valley. And over the years, the front portions of those properties that were industrially zoned, we we changed to commercial zones, and it brought that flexibility. That I it, when I talk about flex buildings and I talk about flexibility, I'm talking about two different things. But it brought that variety that allowed us to address the concerns and the needs of our tenants, which is we want some convenience here so we don't have to get in our car and drive down the road to get lunch. We can just walk to the front of the community and get a sandwich or something like that. So it's a pretty, pretty commonly used tool, along with you know tweaks to the zoning code and things like that. So it's, it, as I mentioned before, what I do, this is the kind of stuff that I, I do on a reg, relatively regular basis, yeah. So well, thank you very much. Sure, you're welcome. Did the, the oh, sorry. Oh, go, I'm ahead. Sorry. go ahead. Well, yeah, because I, I want to uh, a little bit of what he asked too. Sure. Um, this is four parcels, and I know it's in here probably, and I could look at the deeds. Did sure. you buy them all four at the same time, or was it staggered? No, on the same day. You all, you bought all four the at the same, same day. time. We put them. It, it was two different. Um, it was four different owners. Yes. I think three of them were related, and one was not. Um, and we put them all under contract. Uh, three and one, and, but we closed on the same day, purchased them all at once. Yes. Sorry. No, no. Uh, did, the, did the fairly recent change in sewer and water allocation have a play a role in wanting to go to C3? And am I, and am I characterizing that accurately? Okay, I want to make sure. Um, we uh, th did the, well, we actually petitioned to have it brought into the public store. Yeah, so it was part of, as I mentioned before, kind of a uh, strategy on how to invest in the property. It was part of our request. All right, thank you. Yep. Separate, I know separate, but part of that. Okay, any other questions or comments, statements? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. you. Sure, you're welcome. Did somebody have a question for one of the witnesses? Oh, did you, that was for? Yeah, that was the question, okay. yeah, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, I think we're, uh, we're done, unless you want to make any further comments. I did just want to make a brief summation yeah. statement, if I could, please. Uh, thank you, we appreciate your time here today. Um, the case that you've seen before you presents a strong, we would advocate a strong change uh, in the character of the neighborhood or a mistake case. We, we think that we've proven both but we understand and respect the staff report which um, leans towards the change in the character of the neighborhood. You have seen 
uh, through all of the exhibits here, as well as the staff report and all of the other presentations, and also heard testimony today about the two primary factors, which um, Mr. Vigliotti nicely kind of surmised as well, um, that support this, namely the change to the sewer service area and the common ownership of the four parcels. These really provide a much different opportunity than was present initially here. Um, in analyzing this for rezoning, we understand that you know you have to look to see whether there's enough evidence to prove a change or mistake, and then you take the next step at looking at what zoning district is actually appropriate if that first level is met. So I'd, I'd suggest to you that that first level has absolutely been met. Your staff re report that you have in front of you kind of reiterates that and sets forth those arguments. So in in looking at what district is appropriate. I respect and I appreciate the community comments that were made here today. Um, I would remind you, as I did earlier, that this requested change is from C2 to C3. This would be a much different request before you if we were asking to change this property from residential to commercial. Um, but this is a, a lesser change, if you will. And if you look in that legal memorandum, also there's kind of a note of that in one of the cases that even talks about um, almost a different standard, if you will, when you're changing the zoning from a like use to a like use versus something entirely different. You heard uh, from staff and from us that the planning commissioner and uh, the planning commission, uh, excuse me, and this board and the previous board of commissioners have consistently recognized these properties as appropriate for commercial development. You'll see that on the timeline in the in the previous comprehensive rezonings and the comprehensive by request phase. Uh, I'll also note that the property to the west, if you look at, at the Freedom Community Comprehensive Plan, that is also noted as a future land use designation of commercial medium too. It just hasn't been zoned that way yet. Um, the, th I, I did briefly want to address Commissioner Vigliotti's one question about other C3 districts that abut residential, because I think even if you look, I mean, you heard testimony from Mr. Stein that there are several throughout the county instances of this, and I think if you did an aerial, you would see that as well. But even just on this zoning map that is part of this packet, you can see several. This is not, that's not a unique situation in our county. Um, I appreciate Mr. Lyburn's testimony and and agree with him that C3 zoning district here allows for a higher and better use of this property uh, with increased employment opportunities that come with that. I think if you saw individual C2 development of these four parcels, it would not be as appealing as a cohesive development that C3 would allow here. I, I understand, and I've said it several times, that we have told you our intent is to develop this with a business park, but that's one of the uses allowed in C3. But I would further say that the business park provision specifically of the code also requires this uh, many of the same things that Liberty Exchange requires in the sense of a common development plan that's cohesive. So that creates that park-like feel that you see at Liberty Exchange. Um, this. C3 is compatible with the surrounding area. You've heard testimony, you can see on the maps and by analyzing the uses of that area. So we think that this uh, meets the legal standard and then to take it a step further that C3 is the appropriate zoning district here and would ask for this board's approval of the request today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have two actions to take. One is an action to close the public hearing at this time. And then the second action is to either make a decision now or allow us to think through this and make a decision in the near future uh, about the request. We've done both, um, you know, whether we make a decision the day of or in the near future. Um, so, First step, do I have a motion to um, close the public hearing at this time? And the record. And the record, thank you. I move the public hearing and the record in this case be closed. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I got a motion and I got a second. 
Any discussion on that? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Now, we have a decision to make whether we want to make a motion. Uh, well, regardless, we're going to make a motion on deciding to either approve or disapprove the request for C2 to C3 or a decision to make that decision at a later date. Personally, I'd kind of like to wait. I mean, we got a lot of information, more so than we did two weeks ago about this, and I would feel a lot more comfortable having time to, to review this rather than uh, you know, just having it handed. And that's no offense to anybody here that you know, we just so, got this today. Okay. Um, I mean, personally, I would feel a lot more comfortable having the time to. So I take that as professional as well, and you're making a motion? I will uh, make a motion to, um, what would the proper way to, to postpone the decision to? Not to necessarily postpone it, but um, make a decision and schedule it at a near future, whether. Can, can we just say March 9th? And then everyone knows when okay. the decision will be made, if that's okay. And I take it March 9th is a Thursday? It's a Thursday. Okay. <laughs> so I make a motion that the decision date be scheduled on March 9th. Second. I'll second that. A few seconds. Is that okay with you? Yes, thank you. You took away your motion. Yeah, that's okay. That's you voted for me. I'm just saying. Well, okay. you're good at subcontracting. <laughs> is, there any, is there any discussion on that? Seeing here and none. Again, thank you all for uh, all of... Um, the information you provided. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And I apologize. I've got a plane to catch. I need oh, so to that means Commissioner this. Kyler's in charge Commissioner now. Commissioner Kyler's in charge. Mm. Uh, so do we need to do anything to say that he's leaving and I'm now, we just need to do it. So item six, uh, public comment on additional fees for construction and administration services related to Charles Carroll Community Center. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Are you actually afternoon? Good afternoon, yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> Carrie from the Office of Procurement is going to introduce our request. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good the afternoon. Office, I'm Good sorry. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Office of Procurement, in conjunction with the Bureau of Building Construction, requests your approval to <coughs> increase the contract to Memor Ponte Muller in the amount of $24,790 to provide for the additional construction administration services related to the Charles Carroll Community Center. This amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Good afternoon. My name is Kirk Engel, project manager with Bureau of Building Construction. With me is John Bowers, Bureau Chief of Building Construction, and also in the back is Deputy Director Eric Burdine. As Carrie had stated, the Bureau of Building Construction is here before you today to request board approval for additional construction administration funds with Memoir Ponte Malor Architects and Engineers, LLC. This will allow the architect of record to see the project through final construction, final inspections, and any punch list items that may be created during our final walkthrough. The construction period has exceeded the amount of time which was initially assumed when contracting with the architect. Approval of these funds are necessary to continue the architect of record, Mimar uh, Ponte Malor, services through the end of this project. The cost for additional construction administration is $24,979, and this is within project budget. No additional funds are required. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a quick question. So I was reading this, and obviously it says the construction periods extended the amount of time that was initially assumed. How far of an extension has this been? It's been about three, four months. Three or four months. And are we looking at any potential situations where we're going to be extending further past this, or is this where we're going to be in this is it? Not projected at this time. The only thing that has held us back as construction started in, in last year of March um, has been um, supply and chain issues. I understand. Pump house, generator, things of that sort. So we are very close to actual turnover of this building. Uh, we're still constructing as, as we go along each day, but um, the beginning of April is our projected um, walkthrough of the building. Okay, and I was, just, I was just curious as to whether we might be 
you know, seeing additional extensions on that or not. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And and you said a figure, but I, I couldn't, and maybe you answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, what was the original budget for this, and what is the total amount going to be spent now, and do you expect any other change orders, or is this potentially the last one? Specifically, Commissioner, is that in respect to general change orders or with respect to the, the uh, consulting side of the project, the architects? Everything. Though. Everything. Um, we, as Kirk said, we don't anticipate any additional uh, requests for extensions for the architect or the other consultants on the project team. Um, being a construction project, there are things that do happen over time that are unplanned, unexpected, unanticipated, but as we're nearing the completion of the project, our expectation for any future potential change orders is fairly minimal, if that's a fair statement. There's, there are none pending right now that you know of, and, does, and, and, and I knew you're near the end, so you, I, I wouldn't ask us in the middle of the job. I've been on the other side of the fence. We always want change orders. <laughs> um, but uh, so you're saying you think no more. Do you know that you have any idea the total budget now of this job? You have that figure handy, Kirk? Yeah. If not, that's. Yeah, total contract to date is 5.7, 5,758,000. I'm going to say that again. 5,758,000. Commissioner uh, Zavagai, that is, that is just the construction budget. Um, the, I, I don't have the actual overall budget. It's, it's seven point something million. Seven, seven point two. That's what I thought, yeah. Seven point two is the overall, is the total. I'm sorry, I misunderstood and, the question. And, and, and to maybe, maybe address your, your question a little further, um, every project we do anticipate construction change orders on, as you know. Um, and so between construction change orders and um, the architect change order that we've got in front of you today, and additional costs that we have as the owner, such as buying the furniture, buying you know, audio-visual, uh, tons of things that go into a construction project that the owner, uh, us as Carroll County, as the owner's representative pay for. Um, we hold a 10% contingency on that budget when we, when we come to you to approve a project like this. Uh, we're well within that budget. Um, we, we believe we'll be um, giving money back at the end of this project. Okay. Thanks. Thank and I probably didn't ask a good question. That's Commissioner, I would like to point out um, there is a typo on the briefing paper. The actual amount, and I just checked the quote, is $24,979, not $24,790. So it's nine seventy, you said? It's uh, $24,979. $79. $79. Okay. Yeah. $979. Correct. And, and can I... Any other questions? Can I, can I ask just a little bit more about this specifically? And, and forgive me if I'm, I'm somewhat naive about this. So I, I you know... I, worked for years doing uh, home improvement work with my dad and and you know we would go to uh, a job and uh, you know Home Depot or you know, some place didn't have something right we wouldn't just go to the job and and you know do nothing and think we would get paid for it we would go do something else so I guess my, my question is is given that there were supply chain issues which necessitated that that delay in construction uh, where is this money being used I mean what is this how is this coming into effect? Why is this the case that, that you know, the supply chain necessitates the additional money? So, good question. Um, it, it, is, it has delayed the construction period. And so if you understand, we, we have hired this architect well before we knew what the construction period was going to be. So we had a certain amount that we thought, certain, a certain amount of uh, many months that we thought the construction was going to take place. Um, so that's what we hired the architect to do, that, that certain amount. Since the project was bid by the contractor, we found okay. Well, they've already they've already anticipated that there's not that there's nothing going on. There's still construction going on. The the general contractor isn't hitting us with any additional weeks. He has planned for that. So I guess that's the difference. Is we had to assume what the construction period was going to be with the architect before we knew there was ever going to be supply chains, supply chain issues. So, so this change is all for the architect. That's for correct. Management okay. Of the project that's correct. That lasted long. That's correct. Correct. Yeah. That makes sense. It it does, but again, I, I again, and, and please forgive me again if I'm just not. So, again, if I'm the architect and there's the delay that's happening and my construction crews aren't working, I am still getting 
paid even though they're not working? Am I getting that right? Or what's you're not the, the construction crews have been working the entire time. <coughs> okay, despite the supply chain issue. That, that's correct. Okay. There's been other there's been plenty of other things to do, and they've kept going. They just changed what they were doing. Okay, all right. And and the contractor recognized that before we even hired him. That he had an extended period of time that he was going to be constructing the project. Unfortunately, we didn't anticipate that when we hired the architect. All right, thank you very much. Now, um, that, now, so the, now so that makes sense. Right, thank so the architect still shows up at the meetings every week on, a, on an extended construction period. All right. Uh, not, not every week. We, we do a bi-weekly meeting. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, that now it makes sense. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Entertain uh, a motion? I, th I think I'm good. Motion to award the increase of the contract to the Charles Carroll Community Center to and Mimar Ponte Miller. Did I say that right? Yes. Yes. In the amount of twenty-four thousand nine hundred seventy-nine dollars. Second. Second. Any discussion further? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, commissioners. Thank appreciate you. your time Thank this you very afternoon. Much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item seven, public um, possible nuisance ordinance on, and Commissioner Gordon. Yes, thank you. Um, so what technically we left a word out, but it would technically it should be possible, it should be a nuisance uh, establishment ordinance. But um, uh, one of the challenges we've been having uh, significantly in the last couple years is uh, our law enforcement being uh, heavily utilized to uh, deal with uh, businesses and having to make multiple, multiple calls. I have a, uh, uh, an email I want to read to all of you from uh, Sheriff DeWeese regarding this topic. And he says, quote, over the past several years, we've seen a measurable uptick in calls for service at several area retail stores and hotels and motels. From theft to drug activity, certain establishments are accounting for over half of the calls of service in some areas of the county. For example, one patrol area in December of 2022 had two retail stores that accounted for 54% of all the calls of service in that entire patrol area, which covers approximately 40 square miles. We've also been experiencing narcotics distribution, drug overdoses, and other related criminal activity at area hotels and motels where significant resources from the Sheriff's Department, State Police, and Westminster Police Department are used on a daily basis to combat this. Several of these establishments have turned a blind eye on the issue, while others are hampered by corporate policies that keep store managers from being more proactive to stop theft and other criminal activity. And it continues on. This statement, this ordinance would give law enforcement and prosecutors another tool and the ability to address those that turn a blind eye on criminal activity and large corporations that put profits over the safety of their employees and law abiding customers shopping at these establishments. Uh, it's for this reason I wanted to bring this up this morning. Um, and I'd like to move that the Board of County Commissioners direct Carol, uh, county attorney to consult with county sheriff and state's attorney to determine if local legislation is warranted and how it could be affected in addressing this problem to abate nuisance-based uh, law and law enforcement calls regarding these types of premises. Second. Is there a second? Second. Um, could you describe to us, if we pass this, what's the potential process i mean this would include a public hearing and a a, a a lot of items correct yes if if you if the motion passes i'll consult with uh state's attorney's office and, and the sheriff's office and say what are you guys looking for you know and what can we come up with legally that will that will address your concerns we'll then come back to you with a, a draft of an ordinance and and say this is what we've come up with if you like what you see we'll send it out to a public hearing uh, it has to be advertised in the newspaper. There'll, there'll be a public hearing. People will get a chance to comment on it. And at the end of that, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll be asked whether you want to adopt the ordinance or not. So. Any questions or comments? Well, I, uh, I commend Commissioner Gordon for taking this initiative. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I've alluded to this before, but you know, we're, we're in a unique position as a county. We're not the wealthiest county in the state. We're not the poorest county in the state. We've got to find new and innovative ways to move into the future. Uh, I've, I, this is sort of a, a classic example in my mind of, of the third way that we're going to have to embark on. Uh, I think a lot of counties would just turn around and say, well, we need to raise taxes and hire more police. 
or some counties that didn't have the resources would just give up. And if we're going to be successful moving into the future, I think it's going to be things like this, where we say, hold on a second, we don't have to penalize the entire county. And we're not trying to run people out. We're not trying to run businesses out. But those are some pretty astounding statistics. I mean, clearly the sheriff's department spending most of their time in the same areas. So why not, why not take that route? So I appreciate the uh, initiative. I wish it had been my idea, but it wasn't. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of it. Uh, Commissioner Guerin, I completely agree with you, and Commissioner Gordon, I commend you as well for this. And uh, you know, this, this, you know, to your point, Commissioner Guerin, it's not that you're trying to to run a business out, but trying to make them be a more responsible member of the community in which they exist. You know, it, you know, whether you are a resident or whether you are a business, you're part of the fabric of this community, and uh, you know, you certainly have to take responsibility at some point. And so, I think this is a this is a good step. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And I'd like to, um, for the public, the last two votes have been for zero because one member is absent. Now a question. Since it's 115, I assume we're not going to win to close and reconvene at one, so what's the time frame? You have a closed legal. Say, I'm, say, I'm say, sorry, you have a closed for legal advice after so we're going to do that now and then will we when will we reconvene open that will be up to the board um we could uh, apologize and ask the folks to come back at a later date we could pick it a time uh, two two thirty i would suggest apologizing to those who are here to present and and say to come back another time because i have no idea how long closed legal will end up taking and it would not be fair to them to continue to expect them to wait if we had no idea so i would just you know respectfully say maybe you know next week everybody agree with that i, I concur I, that is a great that is a great point i, I think it's unfortunately probably the best at this point that uh and and so before we um adjourn this to go into close we need to go through the agenda and uh everybody should have it in front of them um monday february 20th uh 5 p.m is district five night in annapolis um gordon Carler and vigliotti show is going and um They've invited a lot of people, and they do want RSVPs, the plan, but um, I'm sure you could still RSVP if you wanted. Um, Tuesday, Planning and Zoning Commission, Commissioner Gordon. Um, 2 p.m., Veterans Advisory Meeting with uh, Commissioners Gordon and Kyler. 7.15, Commissioner Kyler's meeting with uh, Reese Volunteer Fire Company. Wednesday, um, 9.30 a.m. is MAKO. And the plan right now is to do that in Annapolis. Um, Commissioner Kyler and Rothstein would be there. Did we get a, an invite to be part of a Parks Advisory Board meeting? Yes. Which day was that? So Mar like March 22nd so that, or okay. so. Okay, so yeah. that's not, that doesn't interfere with this schedule yet. Not okay, yet. thank you. We'll be there uh, before you know it, but not yet. <laughs> again? We'll be there before you know it, oh, but I, not it, yet. It'll be quick enough, <laughs> but not next week. Um, Thursday, February 23rd, 8 a.m., Board of County Commissioners close administrative. 10 a.m., Board of County Commissioners open. Um, item one, um, Department Update Circuit Court. Item two, Legislative Update. Item three, the Ark of Carroll County Department Update. Item four, Carroll County Youth Service Bureau Department update. Item five, Carroll County Public Schools uh, Department update. Item six, University of Maryland Extension Department update. Item seven, Flying Colors of Success Department update. Item eight, Rape Crisis Intervention Service at Carroll County Department update. Is there any proposed change to our open meeting? I would, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this now, and again, just being as respectful as possible. I know a lot of the presentations we've been having keep running over. We have, uh, what, eight 
presentations that morning plus a closed land acquisition session. Then we have the public hearing on the solar moratorium that evening. I would recommend getting rid of it, or not getting rid of, but postponing possibly four of those presentations. Again, knowing that they tend to go over, knowing that they tend to, you know, we tend to ask questions. And again, knowing that we have the, uh, the, the closed session for land acquisition. And the legislative update too. And the legislative update too. That's but we'll keep that, keep that. Everybody say. The, the, the suggestion makes sense to me. It does look like we've it is a steep. I, I, I mean, the point being, we just we are just keeping people waiting sometimes. I know, and uh, that is a great point to bring up. We do have to be respectful of that. I don't know the answer. I don't know how to fix that though. But so we could ask uh, those under items five, six, seven, and eight uh, to postpone for a week. Um, and obviously, I mean, we'll depending just, on if you don't mind, we'll just move those who are com who are available. To, we'll move. We'll only keep it to four, but we'll just see who's. Who needs to go next week? Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's that's totally okay. Rather yeah. than determine which ones. Right, and then we'll move the the obviously the closed portion right up to the the back yep. of that. So, yep. right. so we we'll have four department updates plus legislative. Correct, and the closed land acquisition. Yes, and closed acquisition, closed land acquisition. Yeah. But we'll tell you what, what we'll if you don't mind leaving it up to us up to yes. them. Yes, yeah, I think yeah, like like these guys have said, we've. Uh, we seem to make some people wait, so whatever works out best for for how to fill it in. Um, and 6 p.m. is the public hearing, solar moratorium, down in the Reagan room, room 03, and we all plan to be there. Yep. Friday, Saturday, nothing. Um, Sunday, and I may, I may need to sub some of this as my uh, podcast. <laughs> any other changes to that week okay uh, Monday February 27th um, Mako Royal County at 6 30 in the evening um, Westminster City Hall 7 p.m. in the meeting Commissioner Gordon Tuesday uh, former students of Robert Moten reception um, 9 a.m. Wednesday Mako and again uh, Commissioner Rusty now will probably do that in Annapolis um, planning and zoning for Commissioner Gordon at 6 p.m. Now Thursday, um, I'm just I just glanced down the agenda. So 10 a.m. Board of County Commissioners open session after the 8 a.m. closed administrative. Item one: legislative update. Item two, personal care service awarding of vendor. Um, item three, EMS billing. Item four, Pinch Valley Road closing. Item five, payment management program. Item six, the county NPDES program and uh, permit department. Any concerns or comments on those six items? And then close for land acquisition, Friday, Saturday, clear, and Sunday as Commissioner Gordon's podcast. Okay. Any corrections, changes, we're okay? Yes. Yeah. All good for me, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, we need a motion to totally adjourn open session and go into closed? Yeah, I would make a motion to go to uh, closed for legal advice first and then a motion to um, adjourn after the yeah, yeah yeah yep okay so i entertain a motion to go into close legal advice second second any more discussion all those in favor aye aye now i entertain a motion to adjourn the open meeting second so move. Oh. thank you all <laughs> those in favor aye aye thank you all